Are you an adventurer looking to take your hunt to the next level? Then you're in the right place. Welcome to East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. All right, we're live. Cody Rick, doing it. Good, to, doing the good to talk up, to buddy? you again, man. <laughs> Not much. I just, uh, it's a nice cold winter day here. It's actually warming up, some snow melting, and I just got back from the gym and figured, you know, we'll get on and, and uh, do a little bit of talking. It's been been a while since we caught up. Yeah, dude. Um, and yeah, I don't know. We, we still don't know how we're going to edit this. So like, it might be my podcast, it might be your podcast. We're going to wing it, uh, see where it goes. But yeah, I do always a good time catching up with you. I think last time you were at my house and I think we BS for like hour, hour or two. I was like, man, we probably should just turn on mics or something. But, uh, yeah, it's good to, good to catch up, catch up with you, buddy. Yeah. It, it's, it is funny because I went out to, um, I went out to Bozeman, for filming for outdoor class, I believe it was, and needed to rent a car, and and Cody's got a pretty slick Subaru on Toro. That that do you, you still you still using that? You still running through that, dude? That's a whole story in and of itself. But uh, no, not doing a Toro anymore. <laughs> oh really? <laughs> okay. Well, I had I had rented I had rented that car off of you and uh, and and used it and got to see your house and hang out and show me you got to show me where all the the white tails are uh, in the neighborhood and it, and it made me pretty jealous. Dude, it's funny because like I'm not like a super big well I wasn't a big white tail guy and I don't know if it's just like living here or whatever but I feel like lately I've been getting into white tails and I think dude some of it's just like watching your content. And like, I'm not really, I feel like most of the whitetail content I see is, you know, like, I don't want to like, it's like Midwest stuff, you know, and it's just like, you know, sitting on fields or whatever. And so like, it's never been that interesting. And I think a lot of people resonate. And I think this is why your content does so well is because, you know, a lot of people are like, uh, you know, I don't have, you know, 10,000 or a thousand acres of, you know, farm ground to like hunt or whatever. And so like your stuff's like, man, that looks cool. That looks like hunting. And I, I don't like, don't want to belittle anybody else's like style of whitetail hunting, but I'm always like, it feels like it's, uh, you know, it's applicable to me or like to my life or like my hunting style. Right. And so like I watch your content and like between that and like just seeing like being able to watch big bucks by my house and, you know, like uh, Montana's interesting. Um, you know, there's, there's some big bucks here, but nobody really hunts whitetails. And so like lately I've been like super keen on, on whitetails and, uh, my dude, my buddy killed my buddy Rex. I'll, I didn't, I don't think I even say this buck, but he killed like a 204 inch whitetail here in Montana. And it was at my house the other day. And this thing is like such a freak. Like this, holding that buck, I was like jaw drop, dude. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this thing is so huge. And I'm like, nah, not 204 really. inches. Dude, it is like ridiculously big. And you hold it, you're just like, this is stupid. This is so big. <laughs> Dang, that is wild. And yeah, and, and, and I, I had a feeling you were kind of getting a little bit of the whitetail bug when you'd be sending me uh, videos um, when you're putting them on your spotter and looking out in the fields and, and taking videos of these yeah. bucks, you're like, how big do you think he is? What do you think? And I'm like, man, those are some big deer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But nobody's hunting him here, dude. Like nobody, like in, I feel like, well, maybe there is, but like nobody talks about it, but everyone's got such the mule deer bug. And I always joke, you know, like everyone kind of just does whatever Ryan Lampers does, but like everyone's so big into the mule deer and you know, that whole thing that I feel like, Whitetail goes under the radar, but also, you know, nobody's hunting those areas, which is kind of like the, the key thing is like, nobody's hunting river bottom stuff. Maybe they are. I just don't know it, but like, it does seem like, you know, when everybody is like doing one thing, I like to go the other way and like, and try to do something a little bit different. And that's kind of like the way I've always been. It's like, okay, if everyone's like super into this, like maybe I'll start doing that. And and it's like be just around less people. And so for me, it's like, you know, I, I start diving into whitetails. So like for me, I have a, like, it's, I don't know if we want to get into whitetails first, but like I have so many questions, uh, you know, because, and maybe these are like super beginner level questions, but like when I think about like, how do you hunt whitetails and in, in the mountains or in, I, or in Montana, you know, like it's very different than anything you even look up online. Like there's really not a ton of information on it, which is funny. And I feel like yours is the most relatable no. because- Every dude, everything is like hunting fields, hunting farms. That's it. 
Yeah, and and it's it's interesting you say that because so a buddy of mine, Tim, who I've had on the podcast before, but he moved from New York to to Montana, I don't know, three or four years ago, and and he still hunts whitetails because he's used to hunting, you know, the big woods whitetails, and and he is doing very well in Montana with, you know, bow hunting them. And he likes to, he likes to bow hunt and he's bow hunting even during rifle season and killing some really great deer in, in some of those places. And, and he's like, man, it's, it's really fun. He's like, it's nobody cares, you know, about, <laughs> about whitetails. Cause everybody, you know, is hunting mule deer or, you know, even elk during that, that time of year. And I, I remember uh, when I was, when I was out there elk hunting and, and seeing, you know, finding some whitetail sheds and seeing some big sign. I remember I was I was elk hunting and we were chasing this herd, and I came across this big community scrape. And I looked at Justin, my camera guy. I was like, "Dude, look at this scrape!" And I stopped and I'm marking it and and my phone. And he's like, "What are you doing, dude?" He's like, "You're never gonna come back here and whitetail hunt." I was like, "You never know. Like, I need to make sure I have this scrape marked because <laughs> there is a big buck that's hitting this at some point, and maybe I will come back. You know, <laughs> it's just funny." But yeah, like when you like, maybe this is a question for that guy or whatever, but like when you take a state like Montana, how do you know which, which, where to even start And like, this is like very, very broad. Like if you were like, okay, you, maybe you didn't have a buddy, you didn't have anything because a lot of Montana has pretty dink bucks. Like they're pretty small. And even I would say like, I don't want to like say, you know, Oh, Gallatin County, like where so I live near Bozeman and, uh, I, I, yeah, there's decent bucks, but I wouldn't say like big bucks. Right. Uh, I would say most of the state has pretty dinky bucks, but then giants tend to like randomly come out of places. And so there doesn't seem to be a rhyme or reason on where to go. And so I'm curious, like a guy like you, like, how do you even decide like what County, what, you know, river drainage, uh, you know, to go off of. And I would say like, you know, historically, if I was thinking about mule deer or elk, you know, you can go to the record books and be like, oh, well, this county has this many records. This county has this many records. And that's kind of how you figured out for mule deer and for, for elk or for elk. But like when you look at whitetails, I, I, is that applicable or is it kind of like, dude, giants just seem to come from different counties all over? Well, no, I do think it's applicable from the standpoint of like when I look at us, if I look at a state like Montana and if I was going to go there and whitetail hunt, there's a couple of things I would look at. Like if I, it, it would depend on my goals, really. If my goals were to try to find the biggest buck out there, I'm going to go and look at some of the record books and see where some of the Pope and Young deer are coming from and the Boone and Crockett deer are coming from with that same understanding that I don't think as many people enter things in the record books anymore so that you know you got to kind of take that with a grain of salt but the the main thing that i do personally is i try to find places that i want to hunt them in and then start seeing you know if they're there and and kind of break that down and start doing some research that way you know for example i like hunting areas that are big timber um some terrain in it because that's what i'm used to now if i went to montana i would want that i think i'd probably want that river bottom experience and try to learn that kind of style. But the, I mean, the whitetails are, are pretty simple from the standpoint of they, they need to have food of some sort. And it doesn't mean it has to be ag field. Like you see in a, a lot of places now it can be, but finding places that have that food, have that cover. And, and also it, it seems like they don't, they don't like to cross over as much, you know, they will cross over with mule deer and, and having some of those, those mixes, but they kind of have their own ranges, so to speak. And in the Western States, any places I've run into whitetails, it's typically not up super high, you know, it'll be in kind of the foothills and, and down in some of those, those river bottoms, because it does have the most food that they like to have the browse is a little more lush and having some undergrowth and some different stuff for them to, to be able to have. But I think doing the state research, if your goal is to try to find a big buck and trying to f- look at, look at the different counties that are doing it, looking at what, what's accessible, because there's also one of the, one of the problems that you'll get in, in some States is like, okay, yeah, there's big bucks here, but there's not any accessible land, whether it's public or, things are leased up or, or however to, to really be able to get in there. So that, that's kind of the, the first step and how I'm looking at it is kind of doing that state research and trying to 
pin down what what type of area that I want to be at. And then also, like when you get into the Western states, making sure that they hold whitetails. It's different in Pennsylvania, Ohio. You know, this I know there's whitetails everywhere. So it's just really, it's for me, I'm trying to find habitat diversity of, you know, I, I really like places that, that have logging and have clear cuts because it's going to create a bunch of browse and also bedding cover for them. They have security. And I'm trying to find those things here. You know, out there, it's really you can cut down on a lot of areas, but just by just seeing where the whitetail range is and and trying to start there, you know, that's that's kind of the first steps for me. It does seem like super pockety in Montana. Like you have, you know, you have areas with definitely, I mean, like lots of whitetail and areas without it. And it, it's it seems really pockety. And it I wouldn't – maybe it's feed. I don't think it is, but like it definitely – um, you'll find areas where the whitetails are very mixed with mule deer. And then you'll find areas where, you know, it's pretty just much, pretty much just whitetails. And so like, when you look at it, it's like, it's kind of difficult. And from what I've seen in Montana, like there's a little bit, you could look at the record books. You can kind of just hone in on ag, um, you know, clearly the river bottoms, see the river bottoms tend to hold, I would say a lot more black tails, but at the same time, like that's just like where everyone's focused. And so, you know, those can, and they're limited access they're all these things. So like, it tends to like, be that highlighter that most hunters are going to go to. Like if anybody is thinking about public land, whitetails, generally speaking, they're like, Oh, river bottoms uh, with public land. Well, that's pretty narrow. Like he narrows it down enough to like, there's not going to be a ton of uh, older age class. Cause everyone's like shooting them out or whatever, but like, that's kind of like, you know, like what's the next level. So I would say like, you know, okay, for me, like, okay, I want whitetails, uh, you know, one hunt the river bottom. That's the experience. Everyone says that you look on Onyx and all of a sudden it's like, there's, you know, oh, this has quite a bit of public and well, duh, there's going to be 10 dudes hunting that. Right. And so it just like, you're like, what's, what's a guy like you, how does he think outside of the box? So one, one way that I would say is, is I don't always attribute a lot of deer with big deer. So, you know, personally too, like with Montana, if I was like really trying to target some, some big deer, I would head to some of the mountain ranges that historically have some older age classes of deer. And I'm not going to highlight that, you know, the, those areas on the podcast here, but like, I would go to these places that, that, that are, 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 I mean, they're pretty well known, but to be able to go there and try to find them in those places where people aren't traditionally even hunting white hills and you might go days without seeing them, but you have a chance of finding a really old bruiser that's kind of coming through. And I would, I would start the, the scouting process and trying to f get in there and, you know, find, get boots on the ground. But I think the, the, again, one of the biggest hurdles and, and things that I think I would struggle with, with the Western side of it is just figuring out where their range is, because I know you said they do cross over a lot, but you know, you can get, there's some really big whitetails in the Montana mountains as well that have that, but they don't go up super high. So you got to figure out kind of where that range is in, in elevation where they like to be at and then get up in there and, and really scout it out and try to find places that, and try to find a sign, try to find the scrapes, try to find, um, well, if you go there in the spring, try to find some sheds. I mean, that's, that's always uh, a, a decent indicator. The problem with that too, is depending on the winter, they could be in the sheds could be in a completely different location if they're, you know, dropping down lower and, and, and moving there, but trying to find some tracks and trying to find habitat that just looks white taily, which for, for me, it's, 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 places that have brows have a lot of that kind of newer growth stuff that, that mixes through it and, and be able to go in, but trying to break down those areas into a manageable chunk to even begin with the, with the e-scouting and then, you know, getting some boots on the ground and, and being able to, to go in there and check it out. But the, the moral of what I'm saying there is I wouldn't always just look at, you know, you think of Montana as the river bottom spot and, th and there are limited options to be able to do that. So, I, and I don't really know the exact pressure of those types of places, but in my head, it would be like, there's probably a lot of people attracted to there. So if I'm looking at just trying to hunt a, a big deer and everything, I would go 
to the to the mountain approach and and try to get up in there and find those deer in the places that people are hunting elk and hunting mule deer and trying to get to those types of spots versus some of those traditional areas and and it might even seem like those deer are ghosts it's things that you might bump into in the timber that you know that you but you but the, they'll leave sign behind to be able to let you know that they are there and that's what i would be would be going off of Dude, it's funny you say that because um, <clears throat> so we were uh, chasing cats, uh, so we were running dogs, and I would say fairly close to town, and we get to this like area where you know it's it's timber, but it's not like very huntable elk timber. It's not mule deer timber. We get in there, and it's like covered up in in rubs, and I'm like, dude, this would be so cool to hunt this. Nobody, I can tell you, nobody's hunting you know, timber bucks, white tails in Montana. It just doesn't happen. Like if anybody is, it's river bottom and they're rattling. So uh, this one spot we found, I was like, man, this would be super cool just to come in here, you know, and set up a ground blind or a tree stand or something like that. Cause like, dude, just covered in rubs. I'm sure there's a ton of deer, uh, you know, and like, it's just kind of a cool different atmosphere. Uh, I like that kind of like idea of hunting, like those mountains that are, you know, off the rivers, but like, you know, clearly there's like, that's where the populations are. So you kind of got to hunt those. Um, but you know, take like a, so when I lived in Oregon, we used to hunt this late season muzzleloader hunt and, uh, it was super fun, uh, December hunt, hunting, rutting white tails. And those were mountain bucks. And it's funny. I think the first place we ever went, I think I've talked to you about this, but like the first place we ever went to, you know, had great numbers, ended up having some pretty giant bucks. Um, I think we ended up killing one of my buddies killed one that was like mid three six or one sixties. And, uh, so like had like that potential, I like, we searched the mountains thinking like, you know, oh, it's all like this. And we never really found another spot like that. You know, I've hunted in Idaho, like, cause I was like, oh man, how do we do this? Like in Idaho, how do we just another state? And all, we searched all over Idaho. We never did find another spot like that. You know, and I think of, I, when you're telling me like, oh, go to the mountains, how do you just choose a spot in the mountains that like you were talking about, you know, the, you know, the feed and, and the things that that whitetail country, right. But like, when you like think about Idaho or something, you know, these mountain bucks in Idaho, how do you even, where do you start? Cause there is no, you know, there's no, you know, agriculture fields, uh, roughly speaking, a lot of like the feed or buckiness, like is all the same throughout most of the mountain. Like, how do you start to like select or, you know, deselect areas, in these big mountain states for whitetails, man. I, well, I will. I will say, like, I have not done it personally to to give you, like, saying, like, yeah, this is definitely what would work. But what I would do, based off of talking <laughs> to people that are really successful in in those in those types of areas, in Idaho specifically, Troy Pottinger is is an absolute animal with whitetails and killing really big deer there in in northern Idaho. And so I, I and what I would do personally is, is going in and looking for areas that have those clear cuts. I mean, that would, to me, you find, start to find clear cuts, you start to find logging. You're almost always going to find whitetails in those types of areas from what I've seen from elk hunting in places that are around there. And then just from talking to people. And then from my experience in the East, it's like clear cuts are, are, are known to have whitetails around them because they have all of that feed. And that's something that you can see on a map and it gives you that identifying quality because it would be really difficult if you don't know where the whitetails are. I mean, you can look at like the whitetail ranges and kind of see, um, the, the maps that you can find online and the, in the state websites and the different mapping resources and everything that are out there to be able to give you an idea. But if you're just looking at timbered ridges and going through now, I can mark a bunch of places on a map where I think they would be, but you're going to have to spend a hell of a lot of time into those places to figure out if they're actually, <laughs> right. if they're actually there. And I think that's, that would be the the most difficult part of it. But I think that the, the part about the logging cuts is where I, I would almost bet money on it that you would find deer in those places. And, and also because of those cuts providing so much more food in places that they are just basically browsing and they don't have agricultural fields, you're probably going to get better quality of deer based off of that as well. And, um, you know, with States like Idaho and, and, um, Montana and stuff having gun seasons during the rut. I mean, I wouldn't really try to bow hunt them at least at first until I had it figured out, but you can get in some of those places where you get up into a tree 
and you can see you get up into a tree, carry a saddle, uh, you know, a couple lightweight sticks in, get up just high enough to get above some of that brush and that new growth. And now you can see a long ways, but they still feel secure because they have that cover that's taller than them and they're in there and they're moving around and all the briars and, and different stuff. So that, that's where personally I would start. And I do want to make that, I do want to make a trip like that happen. And I, I've been saying it for a few years and haven't done it yet, but that's, I really want to try it. I just know that it's going to be such a learning curve that it's, it's been hard for me to get the, um, the, the full motivation <laughs> to go leave whitetail hunting in, in November here to, to go out there and, and try it. Uh, next year we should do it. Um, but you know, the other thing is you're saying that, you know, I think there's another advantage if you will, is everyone else is kind of looking for rifle spots. And I think if you really go at it and say like, you know, I'm going to be looking for archery spots. Nobody's doing that. Right. And so people are looking for those spots where they can see a lot. The same is absolutely true for elk and mule deer, by the way, you know, everyone's kind of, they want to go to these big parks. They want to go to these glassing knobs where they can see, you know, miles and miles, but it's like that spot that I found when I was cat hunting and it's just covered in rubs. Nobody's going to hunt that because it's rifle season. Why would you, you know, you can only see it maybe a hundred yards. And so like by, by, selecting spots and, and this like a cool, I don't I have a ton of experience with this. this is, you know, armchair quarterbacking to the 10th degree here. But like, you know, if I think about it, I'm like, okay, you know, if I go into areas where like archery is, I mean, it's a very limited, uh, you know, view it's limited shot opportunities at distance. So you're like, I'm going into this being like, okay, I'm looking for an, a, a sweet archery setup. You know, I see, I see that as like, oh, that's a great way to kind of just get away from people as well. Uh, now it depends. Like if you're like, I only got a couple of days, um, uh, you know, maybe you just want to take a rifle. Uh, you know, I've actually had this, like, I, I kind of want to shoot, uh, or do some rattling and like shoot one with lever action. I'm big, you know, me and your brother, we get along well with the whole lever action thing. So <laughs> to me, it's like, yeah. you know, I, that'd be super fun. But I also look at areas where, you know, I can just archery hunt and do that. Um, as a, just not even just like, I want to archery hunt them, but like, it's a way to like, select areas that other people aren't going to be hunting. Well, and, and, and you, that's, I'm really glad you brought up that point because I think that's, that's how you differentiate between somebody else. And it's, it's the same way here is like when everyone likes to see things and be open and beautiful and what, and my thought process with like getting near one of those clear cuts is that's, it's, it's your starting point. You may even get up into a tree where you can see for a day and observe and see if you can see deer movement and kind of start to pinpoint some things. But Typically when you get in areas like, like you, like you said, that's probably where a lot of, you know, hunters would go. And if it's an area that has pressure, you know, I'm kind of, I guess I'm kind of looking at it from the perspective of not thinking there'd be a whole lot of, a lot of pressure, but maybe I'm, maybe I'm completely wrong, but, and then finding those areas, finding that, that cover where they may be bedding in, maybe it's a kind of a thicker point near that cut that's coming out and there's a bench that funnels off it and you find this big ass scrape and you might only be able to see 30 yards and maybe you still are carrying a gun or maybe you are carrying, you know, your lever action or whatever, but you set up in a way that you're, you know, bow hunting it. And the way that I would go into to doing that, I wouldn't go in of like, all right, I'm going to go and I'm going to set in this tree and go climb up there. If I don't know what's going on, I would still hunt it and just, you know, sneak through these spots, hmm. check how the winds interact in those places, see how the thermals are, are working and just seeing. And then if you start bumping deer, yeah, it might seem like a bad thing, but to me, that's just confirmation. It's like, all right, I found deer here. And as long as you don't like, I, I'm also a believer with whitetails, which you don't hear this as much in, in the farm country world, but everyone's like, oh, you know, it's the worst thing in the world to bump a buck. And I don't, I don't believe that. And if you, especially if you bump a buck, and it's not wind related, if it's sight sound and they got away unscathed. Now, if you almost step on one and they get up and they take off now, you, you, you scared him pretty good. And he might, it might be a little bit before he comes back, but if he gets away unscathed and you just see his tail going down over in the back of his rack, his plan works. So he's going to come back to that area and it wouldn't even be a bad idea just to sit there right then and sit there for the rest of the day because he may just do a circle and come back into that location to, to go hang out. Dude, it's funny you say that. Cause I say the same thing about elk and, um, I, and I 100% have uh, subscribed to that with whitetails. I always assume like if you bump a whitetail, it's over. And, but with, like with elk, I always tell people like you, 
you're better off to just bump them and know where they are than to like sneak around and think there's an elk behind every tree because they're, they're so stretched out that like, you know, if you just were to like still hunt, you know, your way through the mountain, you wouldn't, you, you may not cover enough ground to even see an elk, you know, versus like, I'm just going to go fast and cover ground. And then when we run into elk, we'll, we'll, you know, mitigate that problem as it comes. But like so many times, you know, if they don't smell you or, you know, you just bump into them, like it's definitely not over. It's not, a, it's, it's much better to cover ground and find elk than to like still hunt, sneak around and never see an elk. And I, I'm a thousand percent. Uh, so I, I see the parallel there between the whitetail and the elk. Um, but it's funny. Uh, I would love to like, w- when you talk about like out outside of season, you're like, okay, being in an area, when I think of like, I've learned a lot by just watching the whitetails in my yard, which, you know, like maybe they're, some people are probably like, Oh, they're yard deer. I, they're not quite yard deer. Like these are river bottom deer or whatever. And they're on pretty good chunk of ground. But what I see is interesting because like since the rut closed, I don't think I've seen a buck, like I, maybe a really tiny dink buck. And so when you like look at an area, you're like, Oh man, there's a bunch of deer here. Um, you know, how do you think about scouting outside of season, like summer deer, summer populations, winter populations, uh, you know, seeing the bucks. Uh, like, I just find it like at my house, man, the, there's a week where all of a sudden random bucks start showing up and it's like, are they showing up everywhere? Are they showing up here? Cause the does are here, you know, like what's, you know, what's your take on like year round scouting? Yeah. So, and and I, I really like the springtime before things start greening up because you can see everything, you know, the grasses aren't growing. You can see the scrapes, the rubs pop. You can see the sign from the previous season. But what one thing to, to take note of that is, and, you know, I, I've spent, it's, it's actually been a little bit of a learning curve with me of, I've spent most of my time hunting the rut because that was when I would take my time off of work. You know, that's when I would take my vacation to spend a week or two and hunt the rut. And then as I've transitioned to hunting different times of the year, some of that postseason scouting, it's tough to tell when that sign is laid down other than the pre rut and rut sign. So it's like, okay, when you start finding, you know, a lot of scrapes, now scrapes can be used year round, but if you're going to put a rule of thumb on it, it's like, it's probably an October and November thing. So you start finding that kind of sign, the scrapes and, and some of those rubs. And it's like, all right, this is, I know these deer are here during that October, November timeframe, early season, you know, September and beginning October, maybe they're not, but you might start seeing what, what, um, what I call like velvet rubs that you might just see a bunch of saplings that are just kind of ripped up in an area where they're just, trying to get the velvet off of their their rack and they may not even come back to that area until later so you start seeing a little bit of that and it's like okay that that might be a little bit more early season stuff but when there's no foliage and there's no brows and grasses that are really up like in that in that spring time frame it's it's hard to see what is going to be a food source whereas you know in the in the east coast where you have oak trees and stuff you can see there's oak trees and there's potential for acorns which could make that a good early season spot and the western you know mountain side of it it would be a little bit more difficult to be able to see it but the rut sign would definitely be able to be visible enough to be able to see and it's it's until you look at enough rubs and really be able to to see it and try to be able to age them. It's tough to know like, okay, what time of year was this? When are they doing this? Now they're type of rubs that, that I look for called signpost rubs. And, and basically they'll be shaped kind of like an hourglass that you can see year after year they're rubbed, you know, that, that the tree starts dying where the rub was, and then you see fresh tine marks going on it. And that to me means that that is, I, I treat that almost like a community scrape. So it's a, it's a travel corridor for, and it may only be one buck that hits that rub, but all the other bucks in the area will come through and sniff it and check it. And it's kind of like a communication tool. And sometimes multiple bucks will hit it. Those signpost rubs, sometimes there'll be a buck that hits it his whole life. He dies, another buck takes it over. And sometimes that rub just dies because it was a single deer's kind of crossing point there hmm. and uh, of a travel route. So it's really reading that sign in the area. And it would take a little bit to really figure out what good sign looks like in a particular area. And that, it, it always takes me a little bit of time when I go to a new place of like, 
what does good sign actually look like? And it takes walking a lot of ground. And that's why I do like the, the springtime because you're not worried about bumping deer. You can just, you know, move and just cover ground, see what's going on and start putting pieces of the puzzle together. You know, I'll, I'll look at a place at hey, e-scout and I'm like, I'm going to go through here and put 12, 15 miles on in a day and just cover it. I'll go through kind of quickly marking spots. And then I go back and I look at the map and I start looking at trends like, okay, there was a bunch of sign here bunch of sign here and typically you'll start to see in areas that have elevation that they like to hang around specific elevation lines they might drop down a little bit to feed and come up to bed but when you start seeing bucks will move horizontally around some of these mountains and they will drop down in drainages and everything but when you find an elevation line where there's a bunch of sign and maybe some bedding it's like that's a really key point to note that you could probably go on that ridge across over there and go to that same elevation line and you'll start to find some of the similar sign. So that's, that's an important thing. But as far as, again, going back to the early season side of it and the different times of year, it's really going to be dependent a lot on the food and the cover. And, you know, with say your area and you're not seeing anything after the rut, I mean, if, if I remember right, you had a lot of like kind of early season foods that were out in those fields that came off the, the river bottoms. Is that correct? Yeah. What was, what was planted there? Mm-hmm. The, there's uh, they like to hit the alfalfa until it turns. Um, and then, you know, kind of October ish, they start stop using the alfalfa as much. Uh, and then you'll start seeing them. They start hitting the wheat, uh, but yeah, I would say start hitting the wheat fields, uh, mid October ish until that's kind of all gone. And then, you know, now it's like you see some does, but not nearly the numbers. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. But it's, it's really just, like I said, the, the, the scouting process and that's where I would take it in another level. And then I would go in there in late summer and now starting to check it out. That's where you're going to start to see like, okay, when season opens, especially if you have a September opener, of, all right, now there's, there's some more sign here. There's a bunch, you know, there's deer here now, and now it's real time Intel that you're going with the the spring scouting is to kind of get you in that right direction start to see some historical sign. And then by doing it right before the season and kind of getting in there, now you're starting to see what's actually happening at that time of year. And you can kind of follow the shifts a little bit. That's, that's personally, that's how I'd look at it. So if you were going to hunt Montana, let's just say you were going to hunt the rut, uh, like November time frame. you know, a lot of it, uh, when you think about rut hunting, well, when I think about rut hunting, it's like almost got to just be in the, in the spot and wait for stuff to come through. Right. Um, and I know you kind of bounce around, uh, you, you spend a lot of time, you know, that's kind of the advantage of the tree saddle and stuff like that. You know, like if you, let's just say late November, uh, river bottom, are you, keying in on specific areas or are you just kind of keying in on like, Oh man, there's a lot of deer in this, like this area. Uh, you know, I'm just going to be in that area and see what runs by. When it comes to the rut, I mean, I just want to find the does and it's like find the does and then find places that are going to pinch down with cover in between those places. Say you see a dupe, a group of does say you're, I mean, with a river bottom spot, I'd imagine you'd be able to glass it a little bit from afar. It's like, all right, right in the evening, you start seeing some does coming out of this group of cover and coming out towards these fields or, or moving over here. And then you see some down here and you look at the map and you start seeing some, some bottlenecks there of, of, and, th- and this is uh, my buddy that, that hunts that a lot during the rut, you know, this is kind of, he's like, it's really not that difficult to, because there are groups of trees that run along those, those river bottoms and you can find it, but especially mature bucks, they just, they love that cover and they love edges so much that, you know, they're, and it might not just be like a tree to an opening, you know, it might be inside of those trees, but now all of a sudden you have uh, a thicket of some sort of thicker, whatever it is, whatever the the species is in the area, the plants and the bushes in there. And they want to be on that edge, or if not just inside there, even as they're cruising and they're going to cruise, you know, some of the, the downward sides of those, those potential bedding areas from the easiest path they can get to those different areas. And then it's, once they start getting locked down with those does, they're going to push them into those thicker areas and kind of hold them in there and just do some circles around the outside. I mean, I was where I had killed a buck in West Virginia this, this past year, I was doing spot and stock and 
after I had bumped them off this, this side hill in a thicket, the doe took the buck way out in this wide open bottom, but it looked wide open, but there was a little briar thicket basically inside of it. But you, when you're glassing it, you couldn't even see that until you got up close to it just because everything looked very similar. So sometimes cover isn't as, doesn't need to be this, you know, it, it doesn't need to be this very defined thing. Sometimes cover can mean just a, a, a slight difference in each area, depending on what cover looks like is, is a little bit different. And, and they'll like to, to, to put them, you know, have those does in those places. And when you, when you can have a visual advantage in glass, you can really take advantage of that and really even get on the ground and kind of sneak your way into that, to those places and try to get close to it. And almost like what I was doing was, um, I was actually challenging the buck almost like you would do think about like what you do with an elk and, and you get in and, and you're trying to, you know, you're trying to talk to the, the lady a little bit there. That's, you know, bedded there with them. And by doing that, you can get them depending on his temperament, get them riled up and have him actually come in. So that's a, another kind of strategy there as far as going, going in, <laughs> yeah. but, but really trying to find there's, there's two, two things really to think about with with the rut and how I would look at the river bottoms is finding the does and then finding the places that pinch down with cover between where the does are. And it's just like, there's, there's two different kinds of strategies there of hunting the does right on their bedding versus finding the connecting points between them to get those bucks that are cruising to find the next doe that's receptive. If you were going to do, uh, cause I know a lot of guys, just go to the river bottoms and rattle. And so they're kind of like sneak in, get close and then just rattle, basically work their way down a river bottom. Like is, if you were going to do that, would you kind of going back to that tactic of like, you know, slipping in to elk tactic of slipping in the kitchen and, and trying to like challenge them a little bit, you know, is that kind of how you would do it? Or I mean, is it pretty straight? I mean, there's really not a lot of options doesn't seem, or is there like, is there more to it than meets the eye as far as like rattling those river bottoms, like ground level? Yeah. And the, the thing with, with any sort of calling, and I'll say that whether it's rattling or grunting or anything, you you just got to be careful on a lot of, if they can't get a visual on it and, and it doesn't sound completely realistic, they're going to try to circle downwind and get to that point. So trying to have either a wall of cover or being on that river bank or something that's kind of on your backs so they can't really circle around and if they try to you have an opportunity to be able to to shoot them in that place that's something that that I think about and I don't want to be in the you know I never want to really call to a deer where they have a potential of seeing me because they will pinpoint that sound like right now but when you're on the ground you have right. a big advantage versus being in a tree because you can sound more realistic because if you think about bucks fighting it's not just the horns rattling together there's you know you can hear the dirt getting kicked up and you you know you really got to you know throw on a whole theater show and theatrics and you can kind of get into it and 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 make a little bit of noise it's kind of like when turkey hunting when and I'm not talking about your guys' turkeys, but Eastern turkeys, where you got to like scratch the ground and and sound realistic with some of the some of the calling uh, tactics and stuff there. But try to try to sound realistic with it. Um, you know, I, I use grunting a lot. I don't do a whole lot of rattling, but I'll do a lot of grunting, and and especially on the ground, it, it can be really fun, especially when you get into those those bedding areas and you start. It's like who, you know, that buck thinks like who is in my area and, you know, snaps, snaps, snaps some sticks and, you know, make some noise and, and pretend you're a deer essentially. Like that's, that's how I would look at, at, at doing that. Dude, you gotta come out. We gotta, we gotta hunt Montana together. It'd be fun. If you ever get the chance. We're, we're well, making- hey, if, if I get a tag, if I get a tag this, if I get a tag this year, um, you know, if I get the combo tag, like, I, like I'm hoping for, you know, maybe come back out for, you know, a short period of time and hunt during the rut or something and go hit some river bottoms. That'd be fun. Dude, let's do it. I'm down. Yeah. That'd be fun. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's kind of all I had. <clears throat> um, it's funny. I, I see so many parallels between elk and whitetail though. Like I, I know people <laughs> hate it when you compare like turkeys to elk hunting or whatever. Like they're, 
there is a lot of parallels. I don't care what people say. Uh, I've called as, as many elk as anybody else. And I'm like, there's a ton of parallels between turkey hunting or calling anything. And dude, when I was a kid, like I just loved anything you could call. Like I was obsessed with calling ducks in, man. Like I, I just loved anything you could call an animal in. And I think that's kind of like the beauty of whitetail is like, man, rattling bucks in eye level. Like that's an adrenaline rush. It's super fun. Dude, there's, there, there is nothing like it. And with, with calling to animals and I love that too. And that's why I've taken such an aggressive approach, even with whitetails with calling. I hear it all the time. You can't, you can't call on public land in Pennsylvania and these other places cause there's too much pressure. And, and you will hear guys, you know, on the grunt tube and everything, but think about it with elk. You can usually tell when a guy is bugling versus versus an elk and you know, the people that really put a lot of t attention to it and think about how they're are doing that approach still do well with it, even though it may be, you know, a, a pressured type spot. And there are areas that maybe it doesn't make it sense to do that as much, but man, having that, that encounter where you can get one that has that right temperament. And sometimes that's, you know, what it is. Like I like to use, grunting and like a deep like just almost like a growl type grunt versus the bit bit you know just like the wussy type grunt because if you get that right buck that's in that temperament he's all riled up he's horny he's you know and he hears that and he's just like you know what the hell is going on and 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 at that point sometimes <laughs> they just go into zombie mode and they're not even paying attention to the wind or anything and they're just you know coming ears pinned back and that is is so cool about it and and i think there's even from from what i've been told in a lot of the, like the western states and and you know montana and wyoming and kansas and some of these places oklahoma you can have even more success from what i'm told with rattling and doing that like those bucks seem to be more responsive to doing that than even in some of the some of the eastern states and to me that's that's an absolute blast and you know maybe even using decoys and stuff like that's another another tactic that decoys can can burn you but they can also be super good and i like to use decoys in places so say you'd have this say you'd have this river bottom spot and you'd have all these trees that are going through there and you'd have like a little opening in there and sometimes like these bucks aren't going to want to come into that open into your shooting lane unless they have some sort of a visual so you're tucked back into the cover and maybe you just have this decoy set up so that if they are cruising somewhere down there and they see that visual or you call it gives that it gives that you know visualization and that's all they need is that that trigger cue to be able to come in now like i've used the the montana decoys a lot the two dimensional ones because they're super simple to pack up and carry in and i've had it where you know they get behind it and it, it disappears on them and they freak out and you know turn skin inside out and like what, oh, what really? the heck you know <laughs> yeah and so like they can they can burn you in in certain situations but if you have a spot like that where you know, I'm not going to just go out in every setup and just toss a decoy out in front of me. But if you find the right location to be able to do so, I think they can be, you know, they can be helpful, which I did, uh, you know, talking about elk hunting, I did try to do that. Um, a couple of years ago, when I was in Montana, I was having problems being, you know, solo and like these elk getting hung up and I couldn't figure out how to get them a little closer. So I drove out to town and bought one of the Montana decoys. That was just the ass you know, of the, of the elk. And, and I, I, I didn't get it to work, but I was probably not, not setting it up correctly. I ended up just carrying it around with me a lot. Dude, but. I have a, I have a love hate relationship. I have a love hate relationship with decoys. Cause like as a solo guy, like there's definitely times where you're like, man, I really wish I had a decoy right now, but there's, equally or more as many times as I'm like, I got to move. And like, I'm just too mobile. And like, rarely does it work out that you're like, I'm going to set up here and call the elk in there. That never happens. And so for me, it's always like, I end up leaving the decoy behind and then there's something I got to go get. Yeah. Uh, and so like, man, it's, it's a 50, 50 for me. It's a kind of a crapshoot. Like I, I love having them. I carry them with me. I think a lot of times you just need to be patient and, and like really choose that setup well, because like if you just willy nilly throw the elk decoy up and it's not the right spot, that's when you get in trouble and you have to move without it. Right. Or go get it. And if, if it is a good spot, it's probably, it's probably like one of those things where I just need to get more patient. And so last year is interesting. I, uh, 
you know, called this elk in and uh, I ended up setting up using the decoy and I moved up a little bit, but left the decoy there and I probably could have called that bull in either way, you know, but because I had the decoy, it forced me to like stay in that spot longer than I probably would have. And so I'm like, I don't want to, I don't want to go back and grab that decoy and then go, I was just like, I'll just keep calling from here. So like, it almost forced me to be a little more patient, but the same as probably the deer decoy. Like there's times where it's really good and times that, you know, it sucks or it's not worth it. Right. And this is the hard part is like so many times people are like it, this thing is the end all be all or that thing's the end all be all. And I'm like, man, rarely have I seen anything that was the end all be all. Like, it's just like, yeah, it works sometimes. And sometimes it doesn't. Some situations are good. Sometimes it's not. And so, you know, it's, it's one of those things you got to play with. You got to learn, you got to get better, you know, like, you got to kind of got to like make your setup or your system. I would, you know, with elk hunting, I talk a lot about systems and I'm like, if you want to add it into your system, you know, you kind of got to build your system around that decoy. So going back to like what you were talking about, the places you hunt, the type of terrain you hunt, like all of these things matter. And so it's not just like, Oh, you have a decoy and you can throw it into any situation. You kind of got to like plan your entire hunt around like, okay, this is a good area for that. Like, you know, I'll, I'll try to use the decoy. Sometimes it's just not worth having. Sometimes it works great. Uh, you kind of just got to play with it and build it into your system. Yeah, you know, I I totally agree. And 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 two, when we we were just talking about um, elk hunting and and some of the parallels with whitetail hunting and some things that that I've noticed from spending time out west, definitely am not what you know would consider a, a good elk hunter by any means. But I've spent enough time out there to see some correlations and some trends. And one thing I think whitetail hunters do well but it can also be to their detriment as they have patience where, you know, you can, you have, you know, I'm used to sitting in a tree all day long from dark to dark in the same spot when you need to sit in a place or you need to be patient, like you have that ability. And what I struggled with and but at the beginning, especially the first few years of elk hunting, I was too patient and not aggressive enough to, to, you know, when I started getting more aggressive, it, I started having, as you always say, more at bats and having more of those, those actual encounters that, that some work out, some don't, but also the, the, I really think that there was, there's one particular area that I was hunting. And I believe that if I would have completely went white tail on them and sat in some specific spots for three or four days that I would have had probably even a better chance of killing an elk than chasing them around and doing that, that whole game. And, uh, but I, 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 I do that for so much of the year that I just, it was really difficult to be like, man, do I really want to go sit in in a tree? And like, I, I literally had my saddle stuff and everything at the truck and I was going to pack it back in and, and go and try to shoot an elk that way. And I'm like, I do that all year. I come out here to just run around, you know, <laughs> <laughs> dude. It, well, it kind of goes into like the whole having a system. Right. And, and we can kind of talk, start talking about elk, but like for me, you know, <clears throat> I think too many people bounce around. They're like, Oh, I'm going to try calling. I'm going to try challenge. Me. Okay. I'm going to try cow calling. I'm going to go, you know, just glass and spot and stock, or I'm going to go sit in the tree, do a tree or get my tree stand up. It all works. It all works. And I know guys that kill, you know, you name it, they kill that way. And that's kind of one thing I learned over the years is like I'd interview all these people uh, about elk hunting and you're like, man, this guy does something completely different than that guy, but they're both successful, right? They both kill elk. And I think for me, it was, you know, I had to develop kind of my own system, took a lot of years and it was like, okay, here's what I like. Here's what seems to work for me. And I think a little bit of that is like the areas you choose, right? Uh, you know, some areas it's really tough to call some areas. There's zero spot and stock potential. Right. And I remember way back in the day. So I grew up in Oregon hunting Roosevelt's and there was always guys that like hunted at a tree stands, you know, and they'd, they'd find a saddle and they'd sit in that saddle and they'd kill an, uh, an elk on opening weekend or opening week almost every year. They're very consistent. And like, that was their system, right? Like did, they did, it worked well. Again, and when it comes to elk hunting, man, I think it's it's important to just like, okay, here's the, I'll say two or three different tactics that I want to use. Uh, here's, you know, and I'm just going to kind of rinse and repeat these tactics. And if you went in again, like you said, if you spend an entire week tree stand hunting elk, yeah, it would, it would probably work. You know, like it, it wouldn't be that hard. And the tree saddle thing, you can kind of be mobile, like, right. You could like, oh man, these elk are kind of going here. Um, I'm going to, you know, there's a bunch of elk in this area. I'm going to, I'm going to climb in a tree and I'm going to be consistent with this like whole tree stand approach. If you're consistent with anything for long enough, like it'll be successful, right? Uh, it, 
it's it boils down to like, do you want to do that? And I think that's where it's interesting because so many people want to just go challenge bugle elk, right? They want like they want to do the thing where they call an elk, and it's uh, it's really exciting. But if everyone is doing that, like that's where it gets difficult. That's where it's like you know most people are saying calling doesn't work anymore. Well, a you know maybe you're from the east coast, you're not very good at calling elk. B you're not sound, you don't sound realistic, and and C like that's what everyone's doing. So it's it's a little bit more difficult because there is a lot of competition on the same tactic, and so that's kind of how I look at it. It's like you know find your system hunt the areas that are going to be beneficial to that system and, you know, find your own little niche, or if you will, like your own little uh, thing that you can do that maybe other people won't. And maybe yours is that like, for me, I'm not going to sit in a tree stand 12 hours a day. It's not humanly possible for me, like to look at elk and be like, oh, I'm going to sit here and hopefully they come by. Uh, and so like, <laughs> you know, you have a, a unique advantage over me because you can sit in a tree. Right. And so like, I think yeah. it's kind of like balancing that. Yeah. And, and, and I, I think, it's funny that you say that. And I think that has been kind of a detriment of myself with elk hunting of like, I take in all this information and then I want to try these different things and I'd be jumping around. And it really spent when I spent 21 days there in Montana of hunting and it took, uh, it took a little bit in the trip where I unknowingly found my system of what I was doing. And I just kept doing the same thing and adjusting a little bit. And until I finally had, had my opportunity on that herd bowl that I was, you know, trying to hunt and it <laughs> took 14 days of, of doing it. But, you know, I finally got that opportunity and not saying, and I, I'm not at all saying that that was the right way of doing it, but I'd found a way that I, I felt like I could repeat it and I was, you know, could continue to do it and eventually ended up having that thing. And, and there could have been, you know, 25 different ways that may have done, got to that point quicker, but, you know, I'd found that and I kept doing it and tweaking it and eventually got to the point where I had, you know, that opportunity that I was, that I was looking for. And it was, uh, and, but, but I had ran into some other guys that there was one, one guy that every single year he sits the whole first week in a tree stand in this area and he kills a bull every single year by doing that. There was two other guys that I ran into that they go and they sit on these benches on these side hills between, uh, wallows and where they like to bed and they'll sit there again for a whole week on on two separate of the, the two separate ridges, two different guys, and and every year they have either an encounter or they kill one, and by doing that, and it's like there's there's you know there's so many different ways to skin a cat, but like you know if you were to go do that, say for example for me, if I were to be like oh I'm gonna do what those guys are doing, and I go sit there for like a day and a half, and I'm like ah now nah, I'm I'm gonna go try this, you go chasing around, you're just chasing your tail a lot. I think is what you're, what kind of what you're saying a little bit and you never really give the yeah, totally. full no, part for sure. to be able to do it. Yeah. And I, you know, like it'd be like, you know, if I asked you like, Oh, how do I whitetail hunt for the entire month of October 15th, no, November 15th? You're like, well, man, it changes. Like I may do one thing October 15th that's completely different than November 1st, which is completely different than November 15th. And like, I think, you know, so when people are like, oh, what's the best tactic for elk? You're like, well, that's a silly question. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, I look at them almost as different seasons, you know, like throughout September, you know, my my goal or strategy or like game plan, if you will, for opening week, opening weekend is very different than like, you know, mid season, you know, that five to 15 time frame, And it still, again, very different from like the 15th uh, on, you know, those later season. And then like, man, it gets even, it changes in October. And so like, the, like to me, it's like, okay, there's first like where you're at, which is like, man, I got to try a bunch of stuff, figure out my system. And then it like, it kind of blows your mind when you're like, okay, now I have to have a different system for, you know, the early part of the month, the mid part of the month, late, later part of the month. And then even again in October, you know, at least in Montana where you can hunt really like kind of post rut, uh, like it's all, it's all different tactics, which is like to say, like, you just need multiple systems to be able to like, okay, what do I do here? Um, to be successful. Yeah. And, and that's, no, I, I, I would definitely agree with you there. And, and, and it really does. And I keep saying it applies to whitetail hunting, but it does like, it's the same thing. And, and I always, I think of it and especially when I talk to newer people that are getting into it, it's like, 
find what you like to do and figure out how to be good at it. And, you know, obviously like it, wait, liking what you have to do has to be something that can work. But, you know, for example, with whitetail hunters, there's, there's a group of people that hate sitting in a tree, which I would probably put you maybe in that, that realm of being able to sit all the time. Well, it's like, you can still be effective by hunting off the ground and maybe you're sitting on a log or, or in a spot for a couple hours and then you might move into this way and do some calling and, and, you know, still hunt through and, and do different things. But it's like, if you're going to do that, you know, do, you know, find what you like to do and you'll, you'll be better at it than forcing yourself to do something that you, you don't really love to do or a a style. And, And I think, that's, that's something that, that I consider with it. And then what I kind of came to with the elk hunting portion of it for myself, it's like, I didn't want, that wasn't the experience I was looking for to go sit in a tree and, and do that because I do do that whitetail hunting (laughs) and, and not saying that it would have worked out, but there was a, you know, some situations where there was bulls that were doing some similar things, multiple days of doing the same thing, going down some of these and, you know, saying that now you're like, what were you doing? But, you know, this is hindsight and, and, and kind of learning from it, but I don't know. There's just, you you kind of have to look at the way that you want to do things, whether it's whitetails or, or elk and, and kind of follow that. Even in West Virginia this past year, it literally took a podcast the night before I killed my elk when I was talking with my buddies down there and I'm like, yeah, I go, if I go sit on this Ridge, I said, I think I can get that big eight point. If I sit there all day for three or four days, he's going to come through you here again, checking those does. And, and he looked at me, he's like, I thought you came to West Virginia to spot and stock in the coal country. And I was like, yeah, you know, you're right. And that's it. I went and I went back to that being the style that I came there to do the whole time. And it ended up working out and, and shooting a buck, but kind of finding those long way of saying it, but finding those ways that you kind of like to, to hunt and you will become better at them when you're, when you're invested in it that way. I think it's important too to not, um, to not be wishy-washy. Like if, if you say like, man, I, I, you know, screw, screw sitting in a tree stand. I'm going to go spot and stock or I'm going to go call. Don't be half in, right? Like I think, and this is, man, this is true for so many things in life, but it's like, if you're going to do something, go in on all it or go all in on it and just do that thing. Right. Like, so say you're going to spot stock. Don't be thinking like, oh man, I should go back and sit that tonight or I should go sit in the tree stand tonight. Cause you know, like just go all in on whatever you're going to do and, and commit to it because I think that's where you get in trouble. You know, guys will, ah, oh, maybe I should just uh, sit this water hole tonight. And it's like, dude, sitting a watering, a watering hole for one or two nights is, worse than counterproductive. Like, right. Like you, you're just not even, you're not being an effective at finding elk. So in in my opinion, I would rather, if you're going to sit water, sit water, but you're going to need a, you know, a large amount of time to do that. If you're just sitting water every once in a while, you're basically completely relying on luck. And I'd, I'd rather spend those evenings benefiting my spot and stock opportunities. With that said, it's like, okay, how do I back up and see a bunch of country or how do I cover a bunch of ground and call to find elk, right? Like, so instead of uh, half-ass sitting and half-ass bugle or calling elk, now I'm like, I'm all in, right? Like, how do I cover ground in the evenings and find some new elk to hunt in the morning, right? And so like, it's like, go in all in on the strategy. I do think too many people kind of do half ass, right? It's kind of back to your West Virginia thing. Like, well, kind of should sit here. I should kind of should spot and stock. And if you're doing a little bit of both, it's a great way to not do either very, yeah. very well. No, I, I, I agree. And so to ask, to kind of get back to, you know, asking you some stuff here, you know, coming from a you know a guy that is from the East loves to, to go out West and try to be an elk hunter and, and get into it. Like one of the things that, that I felt like I spent so much time learning to do was find elk. And, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of information. You have so much information out there on being able to find elk. There's so many resources to be able to do that. And then I ran into the situation where I found elk and I was like, now how do, how do I kill these elk? You know, like getting to that as I, I, maybe you can correct me on your quote, but it's like basically of getting like 97% of the way there. And it's the people that can close on that, you know, that final 3% or however you worded it in, in that way. And I felt like for all of that, that entire last trip I was on, I was at that, that, you know, percentage. And then like, you know, I'd have opportunities and it's, it's all out there for people to see on, on my YouTube. But like I had, 
I finally got in on one bull. This was like on day four. And it was like, I felt like I couldn't find any shooting lanes. The branches were all going down through and I shoot and I hit a branch and it skips up into the air and, and, and I miss them. And like, but spending that much time, I felt like I was around the elk every single day. And it was so difficult to, to close in on it when you, when you're targeting them. And from, and this is maybe too broad of a question here, but how to, how you look at a situation where you find, when you find a herd and what, what, what's your next steps? Like, what do you think about when you find a herd? So I want to back up and talk about, we'll, we'll go into sequence here, but like finding elk, let's, let's start with there. What was your system for finding elk? And you know, like, how would you rate like how you did with that? Like, were you, were you pretty consistent with like getting like finding elk to hunt or, you know, like how, where would you rate yourself there? Um, on that specific hunt, I'd say I was pretty good at finding elk in it. And there was now to caveat that, like I had some experience with the area. I, I spring bear hunted the place so that I had experience and I got to see, you know, a lot of past rut sign started seeing some, some sign there that was there. And then a buddy of mine that, that I was going to be hunting with, um, for a couple of the days, had went in there, you know, a few weeks before and had found some elk and before the season had opened up and everything. So I was like, kind of, I had a little bit of an advantage there, but it took, it did take a couple of days to kind of find them. And it was more so of kind of checking these places and looking at the conditions. So the way I went about it was it was super hot. It was a hundred and some degrees that opening week. And I was like, man, water is going to be super important. And, uh, so I was trying to find places that had water and I knew that there was some cattle troughs and it was like the cattle troughs are, are definitely going to have water in them for the cattle. So those were kind of like my starting points of like going near those areas and trying to find that fresh elk sign. And it took a bunch of different ridges until I found where the elk were at. But then after that, it was like, they were, they were there almost, well, they were there for the rest of the time I was there. So did you hunt the kind of like the same herd or the same elk the whole, the whole time? Yeah. Yeah. But for the most part, oh, now, there was, um, there, it, there, there was, there was some different, I mean, there was, I, I shouldn't say the whole time. There was like a couple of different, like smaller herds that, that I had hunted a few of the days, but for the most part, I was on the same herd that just seemed to continue to grow as September went on. <laughs> Oh, well, in that case, it's, it's pretty good. I would say, you know, the biggest thing about elk hunting, and it, I think I made a, st a, a statement earlier about you kind of got to bump elk to find elk in that most people, they walk around, you know, they're like blowing their little cow call or like, you know, around every tree. And I bet they cover, like just for a reference, I bet the average hunter who comes out West and hunts probably covers a 10th, maybe even less of the ground that I'm going to cover. If I was going into the same situation in a new ground, new area, like I'm, I think it would just blow people's mind how much ground someone will cover to like, okay, I need to find elk. And I'm not even talking about one herd of elk. Like sometimes like I'll have elk and I don't even care about, you know, I'm like, okay, back pocket that let's go. Like, we're just finding more and more and more. I want, you know, multi, I want to know everything, right. I want to know how many herds I want to find at least two or three opportunities because like, I think the average guy, and I'll pick on you just cause it's, you know, it's easy and, and you can take it. But like, say you come out and you're like, Ooh, we yeah. got elk to yeah. hunt. You're like, cool. Let's hunt it the next day. And you go in there and you, and you screw it up. And then you're like, Oh man, tomorrow. Right. Like, I'm like, no, 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 that's not good enough. I want, I want to screw it up three times in one day. You know, I want three different herds that day to screw up and have, you know, opportunities at, at bats at. And so like now, like you just went from like, let's just say a 10 day hunt. And if you're lucky, you get 10 opportunities and like, let's call a spade a spade. It's probably going to be like, it took you three days to find them. And there's maybe there's another day where you missed out in there. So now you're down to like six opportunities. It, like that's six at bats now versus let's just say I go super hard and I get three opportunities per day. That's 30 opportunities. So my success rate was one in 30 and yours is, you know, zero out of six, right? So it's not that I, I was such a good hunter that I capitalized on every opportunity. It's that I, you know, I had more at bats, right? And so then you can extrapolate this out where it's like most good hunters won't tell you like, they'll tell you I'm not that great. I just spend a lot of time doing it. So now when you extrapolate that back to like 20 days, you know, like, the average dude goes on a seven day hunt and he gets, you know, four opportunities. 
I screwed up technically way more times than you did. It's just that I had a ton more opportunities and more time. And so like, it's not that I'm a great hunter. It's just that I, I batted one in a hundred and you batted, you know, zero out of six. They're not even comparable. We're comparing apples and oranges. So when you start to look at it like that, you're like, okay, I need to find out. Like, so when I, when I say like, I'm going to Idaho, I'm going to go to this new unit, man, I like the first day, two, three, however many I have to scout, like I am flat covering ground, like, like nobody's business. Right. And that changes a little bit. Again, going back to like, is it opening week? Are we like, man, the elk aren't talking, they aren't moving. I pretty much have to check tracks and water holes. Okay. Like we're going to do 20 miles today and we're going to check every water hole and we're going to look for tracks, right? Like it's just, we're going hard. I don't care if we bump elk. I don't care if we don't even see an elk. I need to find tracks. And I'm not saying like, oh, I got to this water tank and I found tracks. Let's sit and hunt it. I'm like, nope, next, nope, next. Because I'm trying to, the same way you're trying to put the whole picture together, like I'm trying to put the whole picture together. I'm like, oh, cool. Maybe there's five elk here, but just over there, there was 200. Like, which one do you want to hunt, right? It's going to be way easier to hunt the 200 than the the five, right? I, I need to know all these things. And if I only found the five and then I tried to hunt the five for the next three days, like it, there's a good chance. Maybe like I'm hunting super quiet elk that aren't moving. Like there's a good chance we burn up five days easily like that can happen very quickly and we just never really get an opportunity whereas like if we would have just kept going and find leave elk to find elk maybe we figure out you know something else and maybe those five end up going to the 200 like these are pieces of the puzzle that i need to know uh because so many times you're like i, I see people like oh i got this little herd you know and like all of a sudden herd disappears well it's like well where did they go why did they go there all these things. So I'm like, when I think about, I actually separate in my mind, finding elk and hunting elk. And there's a big distinction because when I'm in finding elk mode, I'm literally just like, I'm covering ground as fast as I can. I'm not even trying to hunt those elk. I'm just trying to find out where they are. I'm trying to get the bigger picture. Right. And I think so many people come out and they want to just like hunt. They're like, they're walking this little timber patch. You know, they, they east scouted this like North face and they walk in there and blow their cow call. And they think that the elk are on every single North face and it's just not the case. Right. And so like, I need to just put this whole picture together before I start hunting. And so like, when I think about that, it's very different than like trying to hunt them and find them at the same time. You know, I, man, I, I don't know if I've ever heard it put that way. Um, as far as like hearing it, but it makes so much sense because it, and again, and I, I'm going to keep tying it back to, to whitetail hunting, but the way that I go about like when I'm scouting areas and I probably should have brought this up at, at the beginning part, but I always try to, I always try to have three to five areas that I have deer located in before hunting season really starts. And I know that's not always the case for, for going out, but even if I go on an out of state trip, like I'm trying to find where they're at and I'm covering ground and doing that versus just, you know, slowly creeping through an area at the very beginning, you got to find where they're at before you can even, you know, go to do that and having those backup plans, because whether it's people come in or busting, which ended up happening to me on that, that elk hunt and in, in Montana, where I had this herd to myself for the first seven, eight days. And then once that heat dissipated and you started getting the second week of September, all of a sudden other people started moving in and it was just an incredible amount of pressure of people that don't like people from Pennsylvania. So they didn't care. You know, I had had them tell me that, you know, they didn't really care. Uh, um, they're just trying to figure out how I found it. And, like, uh, and so like, and in that case, like I, if I would have had multiple herds, you know, had located in these different spots, I could have bounced around and not had, you know, been so invested in that spot. And it's like, you know, getting married to a place like, I, I talk about it all the time with whitetails too. You know, find this really good spot and you build this up in your mind. Like this is the spot I need to be to. And then when it's not exactly that come season, it's hard for you to transition out and go do something different because you're so married to this spot. And I see a lot of guys get into that rut, including myself sometimes. And and so to to I, and I think you answered this question, but just to to make it clear, so even if you were showing up, say you were showing up September eighth, season's already open, you would still spend that time the first day or two of just covering ground, and you'd even leave elk that you would find to go find more. Yeah, and you know, this happened to be this year. I think I showed up the fifth or something like that, and you know, I'm I'm really just covering ground and finding multiple elk and. 
it's not like I'm just not going to hunt those elk. You know, maybe I hunt them in the morning, but a lot of times, you know, you get 20 minutes and that's about it. And so midday I can be looking for more elk. Uh, and I think a lot of people don't do that. They, you know, they want to go back, take a nap. Uh, maybe in the evening, like it's just, you know, if they're not going to get up or maybe I'm just going to scoot back and get a bigger picture um, and start working my way back out to find the next. Cause a lot of times, like, it's not like, I absolutely will just drive across the mountain to see if there's something there. Like I'm trying to be efficient with it. So I'm trying to just like scoot back and get a little bit bigger picture, a little bit bigger picture. And cause a lot of times, you know, you get into our elk and there's probably another one nearby. It's not, you know, completely isolated. And so like I'm, I'm, I'm dabbling in the search and hunt, right? Like maybe I hunt that next morning, but then I'm back to search, you know, or like maybe I skip an evening and I just do search uh, and I'm not going to hunt these elk. Right. I'm like, man, I know what they're going to do in the morning. Like, let's go find more elk. Right. Cause I need that. I need to know where other things are. And what's happened to me over the years. And I learned this really well in Idaho is that, you know, maybe over here, nothing's talking and you know, you, you get the classic, like, Oh, the elk weren't talking this year. I have been in places where the elk weren't talking that, that day, that week, that anything but around the other side of the mountain, elk are going nuts, you know? And it's like, that's just the way it works. Right. And so I'm sure you see this in deer areas. You can have three areas and two are pretty dead. And yeah. the other ones are like just popping off. Like bucks are rutting like crazy. Dude, the same thing happens with elk, like a hundred percent. So I'm, I'm trying to keep tabs on all these things and, and just keep an eye out. And for me, it's a lot about which bull is showing up. Like, I'm just trying to, you know, like kind of play that, card of like, I know all these does or all these cows are here, but like, you know, I'm waiting for the bull to come or like the right bull to come. And so like, I'm playing that game where I think it's advantageous though, to everyone, you know, I'm looking for a certain caliber of bull and like, I'm kind of playing the bounce around until I find him. I got to cover ground, but at a certain level, like I do believe even if you want to kill a raghorn, like it's going to be much easier in an area where there's satellite bulls running everywhere it's chaos, you know, like you're just going to have better at bats, right? It's a better opportunity. And I, like my dad would probably tell me, you know, way back in the day, like don't leave elk to find elk. But I find that to be terrible advice because so many times in the mountains, you'll find these pockets of elk where they're not super active. You know, maybe there's one bull, but they got, man, they got an awesome spot and the wind is like really switchy. They're just sitting in a back eddy. Dude, screw those elk. I'm leaving those elk. And unless it's just like an absolute slob that's living there, I'll try to figure out how to kill him. But I do think people get too wrapped up in this, like, there's an elk. I, like, this is like this majestic, like, oh my gosh, I got to kill this one. And it's like, man, there's easier elk to kill. And you, know, when you think about these hunts where you're even 20 days, this is going to sound crazy to people, but even on, tw on a 20 day hunt, like, you can't afford to burn that many days. And it's so easy to get on a one herd and burn five days and be like, gosh, you know, like I just burned five days trying to kill these elk that were pretty tough, right? Like not every setup is going to be the same. Some of these elk are going to be very approachable, what they do, where they go, how the wind lays out all these things. Like the, there's characteristics of certain herds. that are going to be easier to kill one out of than, you know, others like, I've hunted herds of elk that just happen to have a giant bull in them. And, you know, they're very, very difficult. And it's like, man, if this was any other herd, like, I feel like I could get this done a lot quicker. And so like, you just kind of got to think about those things is like, you know, which herd am I going after? So I, I don't love the adage, you know, don't leave elk to find elk. I think it's actually true. I would say sometimes you need to leave elk to find elk, um, to hunt elk. And so like, it kind of gets into this, like having multiple search. And then as we transition into that next part of what you were talking about, I was like, man, how do I get close? Like, some of it is that some of it is like, you gotta, like some of these herds are just very, very difficult to get in on because elk like to find these pockets. Um, and I think about like anybody who's a fisherman, you know, you like, you know, cast into that little back eddy and that, that trout's going to sit in that back eddy and elk do the same thing, but with wind, right? Like they're going to go up into this pocket where the wind's going to be swirling all day. And so you're like, man, I just can't even get close to these dang things. Cause they just keep going there. Anyway, there's, there's, there's times to get them and times not. And this can take multiple days to kind of figure out, you know, like, oh man, I should have been here. Right. And then like the next day you're like, okay, maybe I should have been here. Uh, and it's very difficult in the early season because these elk are only moving, you know, 
20 minutes in the first of light, 20 minutes to last light. And so like you have very, very short windows to capitalize on these things. I think that's probably one of the problems you had, right? In that early season is you're like, man, these things aren't moving until absolutely last light. So how do you get close? Right. And so like, if we, if we separate, like at first it's finding elk and then there's like, you need to get close to elk and this is a category in of itself. So like in my elk hunting course, I talk a lot about like separating those two things and like, and how do you like, how do you get close to elk? And one of the problems that I see, one of the biggest problems I see is kind of what you alluded to. Uh, you called it 97.3, but we'll call it the 90.10. And the 90.10 rule <laughs> is something where it's like, you need to be aggressive and go 90 and let them come 10. And uh, in the course, I kind of use the this funny meme. I forget what the movie is, but it's like, you know, you go in for a kiss and like you go 90, let them come 10. And in the same capacity, I think a lot of people really just try to go 100, right? And so they're <laughs> always getting busted or never works out. And so like, if you set yourself up to do a 90, 10 situation, it's like, I got to be very, very aggressive, but I'm going to let them come that last 10 because that gives me the kind of a little bit of the element of surprise, but it also like just, it's easier to tee up that shot in that capacity, right? Um, you know, whether it's a calling. So in a calling situation, I'm not trying to call them across the mountain. Have I done it? Yeah. Do I, you know, it, it's great when it happens, but most of those situations are me going 90% to that bowl and calling him back that 10%, right? I'm not calling him across the mountain. I'm literally just getting him to kind of divert his path already the path he was going to take anyway 10 percent, like just a little bit to come investigate and i think people tend to think that they're going to call you know this buck or this bull all the way across a field or something you know and it's like that's never going to happen right so like if i can just get that bull to kind of step out that last little bit so i think about it in a 90 10 in once you like have that framework it's you're now not trying to go all the way you're trying to like just set that up and it makes you a better hunter. It makes you think about, okay, where is that bull going? How do I get 90 to his 10, right? Like I'm trying to tee it up to where I'm making it the path of least resistance. You think about like turkey hunting for your audience, maybe, you know, it's like, am I going to go and then make this turkey come through a brush row and where there's a fence in there? He's not probably not going to do that, right? That's a tough 10 for him to come. So like, I got to get it to where I'm basically cutting him off. All he has to do is come over like just a little bit. And so I think about that with elk too. It's very, very similar, you know, and uh, some of that is timing. So if I wait till eight or nine in the morning when these elk are like turning and going to their bed, right? Like that's going to be difficult. The 90, 10 of timing is there. So like, I want to make it easy for them. I want to make them come that last little bit. And, you know, people are like, man, these elk, I can't even call these elk in and they won't come in. It's like, well, if you're only trying to call elk in at eight, o'clock in the morning when they're like turning and going to bed, they don't care. They're not coming. Right. And so like, how do I, how do I change that timing to where I'm there at, like right at daylight, right? I'm there when they're still kind of up and doing stuff, feeding, they're active. That's going to make that 10 easier for them. And so all these things are like, you know, how do I think about that? How do I put myself in a position? How do I make myself a better hunter to like forward think, how do I make it easier for that animal to come that last 10%? Yeah, no, that, uh, that, and that's, and it's so, it's so situational from like, you know, like the 90, 10 rule. It's not like you can say all the time you do this and then this is what they do the last 10. It's like really, I mean, just again, from my, my personal experience, it was like that, that 90, 10 would be a little bit different you know, almost every day, depending on the situation where they were at and where I, I struggle with. And you, you said it, I mean, you, you described a lot of the situation, you know, they're, they're coming back up to bed and they're moving quick. And you know, there's me, I'm running, I'm trying to like, I'm checking the wind and the thermals are pulling down. So I can't get out ahead of them. But I, so I'm trying to like run on the side and I, you know, drop my pack, I'm sprinting through this stuff. And I, I ended up getting that first shot by doing this. And there was two bulls that were screaming at the, at the back of the, the herd there. And I just, finally I was like, they're not going to come to me. I just ran to, it was so thick that I could get close. And I literally got like 45 yards. And then I just, you know, threw out a, a a challenge bugle at them. And the one just came ripping and, and came back and around. And that's where I had missed the, the, the shot. And then, but every day it was like, I was just chasing them up and they go up, they go up this hill and they turn around and they come back down and they'd bed and that herd bull would lay on top of this knob. And there was 360 around him. He had cows and then the satellites would be on the, I mean, this herd was pretty big. Like it, even early the first week of the season, it was pretty big and the satellites would be there. And I was really trying to 
whether I deserve to shoot a big bull or not, that was what I was trying to do. Um, and I, so cause I called in a bull <laughs> that my buddy shot on day two or something and, uh, um, a raghorn. And, and then I was like, all right, I'm, I'm at least going to try to, you know, this, this area has some big bulls. So I want to try to, to shoot a big one. And man, it was, it was just like, I felt like I didn't know what to do. Then they go up to bed, but it felt like he was, com- I'd be sneaking in and I'd see some cows laying there and I'm like, I, I don't know what to do to get. So what, what my tactic was from that point was I'd basically sit there, I'd back off just enough for if wind shifts, I wasn't going to mess anything up and then wait until they started bugling in the evening and figure out, try to anticipate what direction they were going to head down, but they didn't always just, you know, go right down the hill. They might drop off this side. They might go off this side. And it was just like, and then I was like, I'm chasing him, you know, I'm running again. I look like an idiot run through the woods. And, yeah. and, and, you know, eventually there, the reason I got the shot opportunity was I was falling. I felt like I should be able to see him at any moment. And the bull I was chasing, the herd bull had this, call him the Marlboro man. Cause he sounded like he smoked cigarettes his whole life. Just this raspy, you know, bugle. So I could always tell which one was him. And he, a cow squirted out and he went to go get her. And that's when I had him come through it at 18 yards and I was, I I drew back and had what I thought was a a small window to be able to shoot through and just adrenaline and me not completely thinking, wasn't thinking about the arc of my arrow, skipped it up and ended up hitting him in the back strap and, uh, had it all all on film there. And he ran, ran off and that bull (laughs) never acted like he was hit at all to the point where I mean, he bled I mean, muscle, the muscle he was bleeding pretty good and bugle heard him bugling the whole way down next morning, went up in there after, or after giving up on the blood trail that night, going back and, and coming back up in and looking and found him again and bugling, chasing cows around, never once acted like he was, like he was hurt, even like it, even the slightest bit. Yeah. He, he didn't care. Um, so no. if you think about the 90 10 of that situation. So I mean, there's like three different 90 tens I can think of there. So uh, rookie kind of a rookie mistake trying to chase him to bed. Like, you know, I think we've yeah. all done it. Like, you know, and, and sometimes you get lucky, you know, it's, it's worth doing. I still like if I'm on a big bull and I, you know, all dog to herd anymore, I, I have less faith in it. It's more of like, you know, if it happens, it happens. It's like, I'm going to go 90 and I'm going to stay at 90. And if the 10 works out, the 10 works out. Right. So you're dogging a herd. And sometimes it's going to work. Sometimes it's not. But the last thing you want to do is try to go hundred and screw it up. So food for thought, it's like go 90, stay at 90, which is still dog in the herd. So you're going to be close. Similarly, you look at a midday stock, right? And most people, the advantage to midday is sometimes you can get that high wind, right? You got a front coming in or something like that. So like timing, it can work out. Like you're like, today's the day. Like I want to have a solid wind. Maybe I can slip in. And again, it's a 90 10. Most guys will slip in, get to like 50 yards from, you know, the f- nearest cow and wait. Like, and it's a, I'm going to go 90. If he comes 10, great. If it doesn't work out, I still have tomorrow. Right. And so you slip into 50 on a cow and you pray like hell the wind stays consistent. Right. And, you know, maybe you just lay down, get, get as low as you can. Uh, and so like that's usually the, the technique, you know, if you're like, I see where this bull is, I can get there eventually he's going to get up and start checking cows. So like, that's the 10, right? He's going to start checking cows. Sometimes it works out. Sometimes, you know, the cow that you were closest to is just not the cow, right? (laughs) And like, I've had that happen. Um, And so like, that's kind of the 90, 10 of that Um, going into, what was the other one? Um, Kind of the calling scenario. Again, you know, you're trying to cut him, you're trying to go to his, you know, to his 90 in a way where it's like, you're getting in front of him. So instead of, uh, you know, you know, he's going to get up in the evening, but they're going to go a different way. Right. It can be difficult. And so that's almost like a 50, 50. It's like, you know, you're going to choose a spot and hopefully they kind of come down there, uh, your way. Sometimes it works out. And this is why you need so many days with elk hunting. It's like a, a lot of times, you know, I talk about being within striking distance, which is to say how many times you're like, gosh, if I was right there, I could kill him, you know? And it's like, you know, Maybe it works out sometimes, maybe it doesn't. But if you're within striking distance, which is it, that can vary. It can be 100 yards, it can be 50 yards, it can be 300 yards. You know, you never want to screw up the situation, but at the same time, you want to be close enough that 
if an opportunity pre- presents itself, you're able to capitalize. So it's like when I talked about sneaking into that bull, you know, if you can only get to a hundred yards, it's probably if the wind's good and you can stay at a hundred yards without getting caught, that's go- good, right? Like that's pretty rare. It'd have to be a pretty strong wind. But if, even if you only get to 200 yards, you're like, okay, like the wind's kind of shifty. Let's just stay back 200 yards. Being that 200 yards, you just never know what's going to happen. And sometimes that you have to like, okay, I'm going to jump on this opportunity. Now is when the 90, 10 could happen. Right. And so it's a matter of, uh, kind of playing it slow, balancing that, like, I need to be close enough to make something happen, but far enough away to not screw it up. That's kind of like that balance you got to learn as you go, which is to say, you know, you're going to screw that up sometimes. And I think you should always caution on the side of screwing it up because too many people go the other way, but you want to be close enough to make, be able to make something happen. And, you know, sometimes most of the time, actually, when it, when it works out, you're like, man, I never would have predicted that. You know, the way, you know, like your dog in the herd and all of a sudden he like slips out, like that just happens sometimes. And that's how you kind of got to be there. And I think the guys who are, you know, very consistent at killing elk, they just put themselves in those situations enough times and they're good at walking that line between not blowing it out of there um, and being close enough that they can like, oh, um, you know, luck happened, right? Like that. Perfect. I love when that happens. Like this bull came back and, you know, I got a shot. Like that's, that's kind of how those things work out. And too many people either try to force a sh- force something to happen when they shouldn't or they're just not close enough to like capitalize on that luck event. And I think that's kind of what it boils down to is just finding that line for you. Uh, and you'll, you'll learn that most people aren't going to know, you know, how to, how to walk that line quite yet. You're gonna have to screw up some elk. This is why it's good to have multiple elk to go hunt, right? I can screw it up, go over here, find more elk. I got three different herds. I can kind of balance between them. And so that's, I mean, that's kind of the advice I have is like on on getting close and, and, you know, from there it's, you know, there's a lot of variables and things you can kind of take out, but that's it. And again, I think it, this goes back to like having a system. If your system is like, Hey, I'm going to slip in and challenge bugle. You're going to need a lot more elk and cover a lot more ground because there's going to be a number of elk that just don't respond well to that. Um, if you if your system is like, I'm going to slip in and do some calf calls and you know, that's my, you know, I'm going to slip into 90, do some calf calls. Sometimes it's going to work. Sometimes it's not. If you just repeat that enough times, like you'll, you'll find success, right? Like you still need to be good at finding elk and getting on them. But like you, once you develop that system, you're like, okay, here's what I do. You, you start to learn it. Right. And you like, I would say a lot of really good hunters don't necessarily spend so much time chasing the eight o'clock elk. Uh, you know, as you learned, it's very difficult to keep up with them. You know, like most of the, most of those situations aren't going to pan out. So they're like, okay, I'm going to hunt those elk midday. So they get good at fi- figuring out where those elk go midday and putting on a midday hunt, right. Or midday stock. And so like you, you find that system that works for you and, and do so. I think the, the people who really struggle are the ones who are like, try to do that eight o'clock hunt then they end up screwing up more elk than they ever get close to. And so then they, they kind of just run out of elk to hunt because they're, you know, they're like, they bounce those ones and now they get, they can't find more. And then they do, they, Oh, they bounce those ones. And it's like this, this never ending cycle of just bumping elk. And it's funny to me because like almost it's pretty rare that I would hunt elk in like that time of the morning it works and you know, it can, it can happen. But I'm like, if it's me and I like, I got a bugling herd for me, like I'm in striking distance when it turns day, when it gets daylight, like I'm in shooting distance when it gets daylight. Cause I know I have that much time to make that happen there. And then I'm more likely to just back out and try to play the midday game. So like, I'm almost doing the opposite. Like I'm having, you know, the early right at daylight and the, the, the midday hunt. And, you know, I would say the, mm, the, I wouldn't say the average, but most hunters are trying to like, you know, they're finding elk maybe right after daylight and then they go try to hunt them and when they're moving to their bed. And it's like, they're kind of playing just a different game than I'm playing. They're on a different time stamp. Yeah. And, and a couple things you said there that relate to the the situation. So like what I would do after I figured out like kind of their pattern and where they were heading in the morning, it wasn't always the exact same spot, but they were coming, I'd get on this ridge before it was light and I'd wait and I'd listen for the bugles and you start to hear them coming up, coming up the hill. And I was yeah. trying to, to pinpoint it. And I kept getting so worried about the wind and the, the thermals pulling down towards them that like I was 
staying off enough, but I never got close enough that they just, they just pass you. You know, like you're you're out here. I'm I'm making gestures for anybody that's listening to it, but and and they're coming up here, and I'm trying to get close, but I'm you know concerned, and I'm sitting here, and boom, they you know they just kind of go up past, and then I'm I'm chasing them, and and you know, and I and I understand like anybody that's that's listening that is experience of doing this is probably like, yeah, Bo, you're an idiot for doing this stuff. But I think, you know, doing these things and screwing up so many times over and over again, like you continue to learn a little bit more. And like, I felt like even at the end of, uh, towards the end of the hunt, a lot of pressure had built in and man, I couldn't believe the amount of people that weren't paying attention to the wind at all. And were just Blow, blowing them out to the point where the elk were unhuntable the last few days. And that's when I had to go find other ones because they moved down towards private and they, they hugged that line pretty, pretty tight. And, uh, it was just super interesting to see, you know, I had, I remember one point I was, I was, and then my buddy Tim was in here at this point, he had killed his bull and he was in helping me and we're sitting, we can see these bulls on this opposite little hillside, uh, bedded. And it was, and there were some cows, right? I mean, within like 60 yards of us and thermal switch are starting to blow up the hill, you know, and we're sitting there kind of above them. What, what do you know? Here comes a guy with a, a tube coming right up the middle of that drainage is the sense just, you know, combing up and in, in those elk just busted out of there. And, you know, I talked to the guys and, and they were, they were the ones that didn't like that, you know, it's from Pennsylvania and, and being there hunting, but they, uh, you know, they never even knew that there was elk there, you know, they didn't even see them. And I was just like, <laughs> Shakers. I don't know. It, it, it just, I think the white tail side of me with like the wind and thermals is something that's always been in my head. And I think that, you know, sometimes can make me probably too cautious, but at the same time, it's like, if you do, you know, you do have it, you, know, you do blow them out and you're not paying attention to that, then you're losing your opportunity too. I can see where, um, guys get too cautious of it because like, a lot of times in the mountains, you kind of got to take some risks. You know, like if you, if you were waiting for the perfect wind, it may not happen. Like there's just areas in the mountains where man, it swirls constantly. And, you know, I love that people like to paint this picture of like, Oh, thermals do this, you know, in the morning and they do this in the midday. It's like, man, that's like ideal. And so rare, you know, like generally speaking, you could look at those elk and be like where I am right here, 400 yards away is what the wind's doing. And over there, they're sitting in a pocket that's just swirling. And so like, you just never really know. And you can get good at kind of reading it and you can like look at the mountains and try to predict it. I think too many people just blanket like up and down. And the reality is like, man, it swirls pretty good. You know, like unless you have a really strong crosswind. And so I think like there's a balance. You definitely got to watch the wind. There is a ton of those people who just, you know, have no idea and they, you know, walk wherever they want and they blow elk. And that's super frustrating. But I also, I don't want to like get it in people's head that they got to like, you know, guard the wind at all costs because like so often in the mountains, you know, you just never, you can't really tell what it's doing um, until you spend a lot of time and you kind of get experience. So, and sometimes you just have to take risks, you know, like I, I've taken risks and gotten away with stuff, you know, and I've taken risks and, and blown stuff out. And I would say like for definitely for whitetail hunters, like I feel like you guys are, you know, really cautious of the wind. Like, you know, it won't even touch a stand if it's the wind's wrong. And I think that's, it's good to have that reference to know that data. But at the same time, like there's, there's elk, you won't be able to hunt if you, if that's your mentality, right? Like you just kind of got to take some risks. Now, again, it goes into like, okay, it's, I got 10 days of this hunt left. This is a pretty awesome herd. Maybe there's a great bull. Like I'm going to guard the wind really stiff. Like I'm not going to mess with it unless the situation is perfect. Now, if I got five herds of elk and you know, this one's got a a six in it, you know, maybe I'm going to be a little more aggressive. Right. And I found that like, that's usually when I find success is when I'm a little more aggressive. Right. And I'm not like just letting the wind be the end all be all. It's like, I got, it's not great, but we're going to risk it. And, and, Sometimes it works out, you know? And so I, I do think you got to kind of take risks sometimes. Uh, and I like, I'm guarding that with the fact that I know there's a bunch of people who just like willy nilly walk into the wind. You're like, oh, don't do that. But, <laughs> but also you kind of got to go kill elk. Yeah. No, I get, I get what you're saying. And, and it's also a really good point of what the wind is doing right where you're at. Isn't necessarily what's going to be happening over there. And there's so many bumps and changes and, and, and you do have that. And, and again, thinking back to it, I'd say the majority of whitetail hunters are, you know, that way with the wind stuff. The way I've always approached it is I need to be in the right spot. Now there's 
tip, there's places that whitetails bed that they do the same thing where you can't get to them because, and they are there in daylight a lot because they are in those hub systems where there's just the thermals are, you know, swirling around and they have everything to their advantage. But there's also like when I'm, especially when I'm hunting early season whitetails and I'm trying to get close to bedding and be there either before daylight when they're coming back to bed or I'm going in the evening and trying to get super tight, you're, you're, you have to have it almost in where it's somewhat in their favor and, and playing kind of that off thing where sometimes you it messes you up and you screw the opportunity up, but that's how you're in the game. And so that's why it's making sense as you're saying that. And it's just, you know, wasn't, it didn't click for me totally when, you know, when I was elk hunting as far as doing that. And I just, you don't, it's funny because you can, like, you can listen to these podcasts, listen to all yours and, and watch and you do your course and do all these videos, but it comes to a point where you have all these tools and then you get out there and you almost have to experience it for the information to really sink into is one of those things of like getting out there and doing it and then adding that information to it and and now you start to become better but you, when you have those experiences when you screw them up they definitely sit a little bit more than to hear you talking to Ryan Lampers about something and oh that you guys talking about this is important and blah 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 and then if you haven't experienced it or seen it you may not take it as as seriously until it till it happens and that's where you know coming back to your at bats thing and trying to you know, screw up enough that it, it eventually, it eventually works out. You know, a good example of that, uh, if you, if you just looked at it on paper, you should never go after elk that are going to bed at all because they're, you know, in theory, they're always going with their nose into the wind, right? And they're pretty spread out. So like, it, it's pretty rare that it's going to work out, but oftentimes it does. Right. And you get in those circumstances, those situations where you're like, you know, you, you, I don't know, you're just a ridge over or like as you get there, like the wind's not doing, you know, it's not blowing directly in their face. And, you know, to your point where you're like, you're trying to parallel them. And yeah, sometimes they're going to go right by you and you're going to play it a little too, too conservative. And, and maybe that was a good thing, but sometimes, you know, they're going to hold up halfway back and all of a sudden, you know, maybe a satellite came in and is, is challenging, you know, a bull and those two are like scuffling and I've had that. So it goes back to the, like, you got to be within striking distance. And and I get that, like, yeah, you want to keep the wind right. And if you parallel those elk or you're coming in from the side as they're coming up, you know, I don't think you did anything wrong in, in that in that situation where you're like, I could hear them coming up and I'm trying to like not get winded, but at the same time, I'm trying to keep close. Sometimes it goes back to 90, 10, you know, you're, you were at 90 and it didn't work out. They never came 10, but sometimes you're going to go 90 and that bull's going to hang up or, you know, something weird's going to happen or something else, you know, like you just never know what's going to happen. And so it's like, you got to put yourself in those situations and let it materialize. And so instead of, you know, when you look at that situation, going 100 would be like, yeah, there's no way to go 100. Like, it's not going to happen. If I go 100, they're going to either smell me or see me. But sometimes if you just go 90, it'll work out. Sometimes you won't. Right. And so in that situation, I don't think you did anything wrong there. That's just one of those where elk are, it's difficult to kill elk, right? They, <laughs> they walk a different place every time and they, and they, you know, they got great noses and they're spread out. So like, it's really t difficult to like get close to this thing that, you know, it seems like it would be easy because it's so big and noisy and whatnot, but like, they're kind of difficult to get close. And that's why, you know, to me, it's like play the 90, 10 car or play the 90, 10 rule and it'll work out in your favor. One of these times, you know, it's like, you got to be close enough that like, maybe that bull hangs up or something happens. Maybe he bugles all the way back to bed and it works out, you know? And like, that's where it's like, I'm not going to say you did anything wrong. Like I've done that a number of times and I'm not going to tell people not to like dog herds or that it's dumb to, to hunt them at eight o'clock in the morning. Plenty of times that works out, right? You just got to, again, balance that between like, you don't want to bump them out. You're not trying to go 100. You're trying to go 90. And the biggest benefit of going 90 is that you get a hunt tomorrow, right? Like you get that opportunity to try again tomorrow and maybe they come up the same way. Maybe it all works out. And now you got a little more information. And this time you're going to be right at that stump. You're like, oh man, they're doing the same thing they did yesterday. And boom, it works out. And so like, you just kind of just got to put yourself in, in enough of those situations where you, you're you getting more data. And I, I think I look at a hunt is uh, it's, a lot of bit of luck. Let's call it that. Like it's, you know, sometimes something has to go right. But if you put yourself in those situations enough times, 
it, it, it'll, you're more likely every day that it's going to happen, but also you're, you're acquiring more data every single day. So every day you, you hunt that herd, you're like, Oh, they like, they tend to do this or this happened yesterday. Maybe it'll happen again today. And so like you just get a little bit closer every day with a little more data, a little more information. And you know, that area, you know, the terrain a little bit better, you know, they went to bed yesterday. And so like, I feel like for me, every single day that goes by, I have a little bit of an edge, right? I'm like, Oh, I know where they're going. And like, even to this, this bull this year that I killed a pretty good bull. And like, it was actually kind of a different herd. I had found a different herd. Again, I started glassing at 10 AM when I found that herd. And I was like, Oh, that's interesting. Mental note. Well, I'm dogging this bull, um, you know, right at daylight, I almost killed him. And again, I didn't kill him, but I just kept with him. And it was, you know, the eight, eight o'clock thing where, you know, I had almost no chance. He's going into the wind. I'm trying to stay behind him, trying to keep up. And, kind of, I mean, it almost happened a couple of times and then it didn't, right? He shuts up the cows and him went different ways. And, and I'm hiking back to my truck and this bull bugles. And it was kind of like he was going out towards where I'd seen those cows three or four days before. And I'm like, Oh, I know where he's going, you know? And like, if I didn't hadn't looked for those or hadn't known those cows were there, I may have not went and looked for this bull that I ended up killing. I actually thought it was the same bull I was chasing in the morning, but you know, that's a little more data, a little more data. And I, so I, I knew where to go to find where this group of cows had been. So I make a big loop, get the wing right. And I, I find the cows. I'm like, well, maybe he bedded with them and he didn't. And I was like, oh, that's weird. So, you know, I spend a couple hours and this bull keeps bugling throughout the day and I ended up finding him midday. I don't remember. It was like one, two ish in the afternoon. And, uh, and I find this bull bedding by himself. But again, you know, if I didn't know that group of cows was there, I wouldn't even look for him. Uh, but two, like I kind of had a little more data. I knew where they were. I knew how to look into there cause I, you know, I'd glassed it before. And so each day you get a little more information and you kind of figure it all out and then it works out. Uh, eventually, you know, you not put a stock in and, and funny enough, like it was kind of a 90, 10 stock as like, I stocked into 60 yards, I think. And again, I was like, okay, I don't have a shot here, but he stands up and moves. Right. And, uh, I guess we could kind of dive into like what I call the 90, 10, one, which in the course I talk about, like, sometimes you got to force a situation, which is to say, I go 90, let him come 10. But oftentimes what people, what happens is they're behind a tree or, you know, they hang up and you got to like force that last little bit. Um, in this situation, it was, you know, I went 90, let's just say he came like five, not, not full 10, but I was trying to like stock with him. And I saw an opportunity. I saw him go through a gap and I knew that was the only gap I was going to get. So I just cow called. I, I, all I could see was antler tops. Like I wasn't uh, up the hill enough to see his whole body. And I knew likely this was not going to work out well, but like I, I just could see, I could read the situation and know that it was not going to get better. So I had to like force that last 1%. So I make a cow call and I literally run to the next tree. Oops. And I have to range him and draw while he's looking at me, but I was just, you know, like I'll take the risk. Right. And so I, I, I forced that last 1% and I, I get a lot of emails from people or whatever. And, uh, you know, guys are like, yeah, I called this bull in, but I didn't have a shot. And it's like, no, you got to go to full draw and just like step out. And sometimes you got to force that last 1%, make it happen. And in so many times people expect like the primos video, right? They expect to like call this bull and he's just going to like walk out at 20 yards and stand there. And it's like, nope. a lot of times it just works out that he's behind a tree and you got to like step around the tree, you know, and he's looking right at you. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't, uh, you know, and so like, you know, forcing that last 1% is kind of getting into like the, the next level of 90, 10, which is 90, uh, what do we call it? 99, one, uh, which is 90 slash nine slash one. And sometimes you got to force that last 10%. Um, but, uh, yeah. So that's kind of how it worked out for me this year, uh, on, on that bull I killed at least in Montana. You know, I think, I think that's where I, I'd heard that, that podcast where you were talking about it. And I was like, man, like that right there. And so, you know, thinking about it and we're talking about, you know, these mistakes I had made, but you know, if I would have killed that bull that I'd hit, you know, it'd be a different story. Be like, oh man, this is, you know, great. Everything worked out. But in that scenario, what happened was in that bull, that cow scored it out. She ran out and she's standing there like 15 yards from us staring at us. She saw us because we were chasing. We just stopped in the middle when they, when they kicked out and he stopped because she stopped and she, you know, she was alarmed. And probably if I would have took 
two steps over to the right, which I probably could have done because he was so fixated on that cow, you know, at full draw, then I would have had this, you know, clear lane. Maybe I wouldn't have, but I didn't try that. And that's where it's like, you know, looking back again, it's like, man, I wish I would have made that happen more so or gave myself that chance because you know if it didn't work out then it'd be still the same situation i'm in so it's like totally <laughs> it's uh i had you know, one forcing, a couple years ago last little part i had one a couple years ago and i was i was dogging this big bull and man i just you know i get to the cows and he just never gave me a shot never give me a shot man we went probably two miles of this and i'm going through this section and it is super thick timber like I mean, lodgepole that's just like stacked on each other. Like you can't even shoot an arrow through. And like I'm going and I, I saw – like I instantly knew. So I had arrow knocked but not – obviously arrow knocked. And I'm like I'm going through this opening. I would just want to get through and look over there. And I see him like just to my left. And like he just – we just met eyes instantly. And I'm like clearly I have no shot here. But I'm like I'm just going to draw and start sidestepping. And hopefully a lane appears. Because like I mean I am – 30 yards from this bull. If I sit here, no, I guarantee like he's gone. Like I, I know I'm in the red zone. The, t- the clock is ticking. The shot clock is ticking. So I literally just come to full draw and I start sidestepping slowly, sidestepping slowly. And I, I was like, come on, give me a lane, you know? And like, he just stood there and watched me for probably three or four seconds, you know, but, and I just never got a lane, <laughs> of course, you know, my luck, but it was the same result, right? Like yeah. I knew it was over, it was game over and either I force a shot or, you know, it doesn't happen, but there's zero chance that like this bull sees me, I see him. And then he like walks out into the open. That's like, never doesn't happen. So like, you know, sometimes it doesn't <laughs> work, you know, who knows either way, but I, like, I just came to full draw, started sidestepping and like, I, as I, I I went like four seconds. I was like, God damn it. It's not going to happen. And I was like, and I blew him. I knew I blew him out, but I took the <laughs> risk, you know? And it's like, so, sometimes you got to do that. <laughs> yeah, no, that makes sense. And I, I'll tell you, Cody, one of the, one elk call that I never heard you talk about, that was probably the most useful tool that I had on the whole, on the whole hunt was, and this is, this, this was hilarious. So every day, you know, we dog this herd and we'd go up and be about, you know, after about 11 o'clock, we'd back off and go cook breakfast, you know, go back off a little bit, get the jet boil <laughs> fire Easterner. Up. two different times two yeah, yeah, I know. Right. Two different times that, uh, that I had a jet boil firing up and it's, you know, somewhat loud. You can hear, you know, it's boiling water that I look up and a bull came in while that jet boil was fired up two different times that happened to the, one of no them way. was 18 yards. It couldn't hear, couldn't hear him come in from doing that. And again, it's embarrassing to tell that those stories, but it was like, it happened. And, um, Justin, my camera guy was there. He's like, you can't make this stuff up. Like it was just, just and like, we were trying to get away from the elk to, to go and, you know, cook some food and, and eat a little bit there in the middle of the day and then go back and, and get close to the herd again. And it was just like, it had happened twice. And I'm like, I, I don't even know what to do. And and the, the first time it happened, the bull ran off, but he didn't know what was really happening. And I, and I went in the direction he was headed and he went into these thick pines and, and I started cow calling and he came back out and I almost got a shot at him, but it didn't, it, uh, it, it didn't, it didn't work out, but it was just, it was it was hilarious that the jet boil um, firing up. Jet boil was the gun. Mostly, <laughs> it was just coincidence, but it was just funny that. You, and of course, you know, you can't hear, and it's like you can hear those those elk coming normally, and not not scenario. Although I will say that that the the squirrels are louder than elk walking. You know, I've always known that with deer. Like you hear squirrels in the tree stand, and you think a deer's coming, and it's like this, somehow those squirrels are louder than those elk walking. <laughs> well, kind of on that same note, dude, like, um, one of my go-to things in, in the old days, I used to call and like, I have more stories of like sitting there, you know, bow 10 feet away and like, you're like, Oh, nobody move. <laughs> like, what are you going to do about it? Uh, you know, elk shows up. But one of the things I started yeah. doing, um, it, when I'm sitting there, if I'm hanging out in the timber and I'm like, it's a kind of a rare scenario. So I'll paint the entire picture. So, uh, similar to the situation it was in the same area where I, you know, I had to step out around that bowl and hope I got a shot. I had dogged a herd in, I think it was the same herd, but I dogged a herd in there. I'd lost them. They had kind of shut up and I knew there was a bunch of satellites 
And so I was waiting until they piped off to kind of learn what I could. Right. Um, so it was midday and I was just taking like a big limb and I would snap a limb like every, you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. And I was just like, pop, you know, and like, just cause you hear that happen all the time with elk. And so like, I was just pop. So instead of calling, I was doing that. And sure enough, here comes a six point, like looking for me, you know? And like, I was like, ah, that's interesting. Like I was kind of hoping someone would either start rubbing or start, you know, like bugle, but you know, he just came in quiet, but another tactic, you know, like you say, you know, calling doesn't work or whatever that midday, just popping limbs, you know, like, over and over here comes a satellite bull came, you know, look, come to investigate. And I knew they were kind of close. I knew there was elk in there. Uh, but I'm assuming that's what it was. You know, that bull probably didn't know what your jet, like didn't know what that noise was. I'm like, Oh, I'm gonna go investigate what that is. And so yeah. you were in the, you were in the bedroom, like you were close and man, that's pretty classic. Like I guarantee you, either of those spots, if you guys would have just cow called, you know, pretty soft every 20, 30 minutes, a bull's going to show up. And it might've taken 45 minutes. It might've taken an hour, but eventually that bull is going to show up, right. And show himself. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely a lot of, a lot of lessons learned in that. And the, the other scenario with the jet boil was on a different Ridge, this bull that every, you know, that w- I'd walked by many times and he was always bed in the side, but I was chasing this, this other herd and I was fixated on this herd. And after I saw that herd bull, I was like, I really want a chance at him. And I didn't even know what this one was, but I'd hear him up there every day. And finally, one day I was frustrated over there. So I'm like, I'm going to go to this Ridge. And, and in the springtime when I was in there, um, uh, we'd actually, my brother Kurt killed a Turkey off of this, um, this bench. And, and I'd found all this elk sign. I'm like, man, this looks like a really cool place during the rut to be for elk. And had went up there and this bull would, would be down low and he'd go up on this hillside there in the morning and, and bed down and come back down in the evening. And, and I went, went up there in the morning and had him going and he went up on the hill and, and nothing. Well, I think it was, um, you know, a satellite later, again, the same situation, 11 o'clock in the morning, somewhere around there was just sitting down there on the edge of this. There was just like a, a drop off that went down to this bottom and we were sitting on the edge of it cooking up the jet boil and that bull popped up over at like, you know, 15, 18 yards right there. I turn and look and I just see him and he's staring at me and the game was over at that point. And he turned and, you know, ran down over the hill and I'm like, how does that, you know, that, that happen like it, but it was in that scenario. I don't think it was even the jet boil as much as it was just a satellite that was kind of coming back a little bit later cruising around or I, I really don't know, but. Dude, I honestly yeah, think like if you want to kill any bull, and I I'd say any six point, like one of the best taxi, tactics you can do is just kind of be in the right area with sign and call throughout the midday. And dude, I don't know how many bulls I've called in that way. Like midday, those these younger bulls, like they'll just cruise and you know they're curious, man. Like they just they want to like especially if you're in an area where it's like there's a rut activity, this you know bugling activity or whatever. Like man. I feel like those bulls are so easy to call in and they just come in silent and like, eventually you're going to see them. You know, it's kind of like that white tail on the ground. Like they're, they got you locked in. They know exactly where you're at. So it's kind of difficult from that capacity, like sometimes to get a shot, but man, like you could, it just takes longer than people think. Like, I think, you know, if, if you have, if you're going to do that, go sit the entire midday, like eventually a bull is going to come in and I've done it to where, you know, I'm trying to get a bull to bugle or get him fired up. And so I'll just call periodically throughout the day and I'll sit on the same spot. You know, maybe I take a nap. Like it is like an all day sit type thing. And then, you know, two, three hours later, you're like, oh, there's an elk, you know, and finally just piqued their curiosity enough that they, you know, got up to come check it out. So if you're in that, uh, you know, I want to shoot any, you know, six point or any bull, uh, like, that's a great way to do it is if you just be in the right area lay out some calls. Um, and it's, I know it's hard. Cause like when you're like, Oh man, that giant herd bull, I'd rather kill him. Uh, but you know, a lot of people are just like, man, how do I kill any bull? Um, and this kind of gets into another thing. I, I say this all the time when you're trying to kill any bull, it's better to try to hunt the herd, to hunt the herd bull than it is to just go out randomly. Right. Because all of those satellites they're what are they doing? They're following the, well, they're not following the herd bull, but they're following the same cow that he's following. Right. And so like the whole party is just kind of doing what he's doing. And I think so many people, they're like, well, I don't really want to, I don't really need to kill a giant. I just want to kill an elk. And I can't tell you 
this is going to come off the wrong way, but I trip over five points to get to big bulls constantly. And it's not because I'm like such a great hunter. It's because like, they're just where I'm going, right? Like they're always in my way and guys who are hunting big bulls. is like, man, we trip over satellites they're always in our way. Like they about, you know, commit suicide. They run into us, you know? And so it's like, I, when I look at that and I see that, I'm like, gosh, if I was looking for a five point, <laughs> I would just be hunting the herd bulls. And it's like, you know, I think what happens is that if I just wanted to kill a five point, I'm going out looking for five points. Well, when you do that, you're kind of just hunting timber, you're doing those cow calls and like, you're, you're, you're just not hunting the same way as if you were like, man, I'm going after that herd bull. And when you go off that herd bull, all those other five points are kind of doing the same thing. They're in your area. They're in your, you know, uh, you know, proximity 24 seven. And so I think it's like, to me, it's like, go after the herds. Learn how to hunt herds of elk and you'll run into five points. I promise. <laughs> and, and that makes sense where, you know, it, it, once I got towards the end of that hunt, I was like, all right, I just want to kill a bull. And I started and I started hunting differently and I couldn't buy a bull, you know, at that point where it was like, and, and where, you know, earlier in the hunt, you know, I was running into these satellites and stuff that I would have been more than happy to shoot. I just got you know, me seeing this, this giant bull early on was not a good thing for me because it just <laughs> had me fixated on it. And I'm not, I wasn't at the skill level that I really deserved to be doing that. But, and what you just said there was like being in that process of hunting them was like, I was seeing so many other bulls and having opportunities and, and seeing them in that, in that, in that regard, not saying I could have shot all of them, but ha having the, the ability to see them. And then once I was, you know, going out and trying to find these other, you know, lone bulls that I had heard, uh, heard throughout the, the weeks. And it was just like, I couldn't, wasn't, you know, wasn't coming to fruition at that point. So that, that, that makes, that makes sense. And yeah, you definitely heard like our when feelings. You, when you, you look know, at it, th those of us that are out there just trying to get opportunities and you're saying you're tripping over five points. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. But like, look at it from the deer perspective. Like if I wanted to go, if I said, Oh, I want to shoot the first eight point. Right. And, um, and I just like, you know, like, okay, I'm just gonna drive. Oh, I want an eight point. I'm just gonna look around. I might not see a dang eight point. Right. Like it's going to be difficult if I'm just like driving around I'm like, Oh, all I need to do is look for an eight point. I'll just drive around and shoot one from the truck versus the guy who's like, I want to kill, you know, 160 inch, uh, mainframe 10, like, and he's going to go, he's going to hunt harder. He's going to do something different. Guess how many like dink eight points are going to walk by him. Like, uh, they're going to walk by every single day. Cause he's trying to, you know, kill that mainframe 160 10. And like, that's just like, it's a different mentality. It's a different like way about going about it. And like, I, I feel the same way about elk. I'm like, go try to kill this. And the other thing is like, I know you're like, Oh, well, I just, you know, maybe I didn't have the skill. If you want to be a great elk hunter, you want the skill, like eventually you want to be a good elk hunter and have the skills to kill that, you know, herd bull. Honestly, the best thing you could do is go hunt cows. And I, I say like this, to a lot of people like the Utah hunts or, you know, the Oregon or, or even some of these Colorado hunts, like those are really good opportunities to be around elk doing elk things. And you're going to learn what elk do. Like you need to learn that skill. You don't need to learn how to cow call a five point in like, maybe that's, you know, fine. And if it fills the freezer, great. But like, if you want to be a great, you know, deer, like look at it from the deer perspective, you want a great deer hunter, <coughs> learn how to pattern big bucks, learn what they, you know, their food sources, learn what they do, how they think. And like, that's going to make you a better overall deer hunter. And you're gonna be able to kill a, you know, a, a small, you know, three by three all the time. And I think the same thing for me with elk, it's like, man, learn how to hunt those herds, learn what they're doing, where the herds are going, how they act, where they hang up. Because at the end of the day, you're hunting lead cows either way, you know? And so for me, when people want to get into elk hunting, I think it's better to hunt herd, uh, lead cows out of a group, of, uh, like a herd of elk than it is to try to just, you know, peel off a five point. I don't think you actually learn that much by trying to peel off five points. Uh, you know, you're not getting, you're not becoming a better elk hunter, maybe to some degree. And I know there's people that will disagree with that, but you know, to me, it's like, you want to be good at elk hunting, like learn how to hunt herds of elk. Yeah, man. I, I mean, in the same, same respect with the deer, I mean, that does, that does translate where, and then, you know, I, and I also want to go back to something and relate it to turkey hunting and make everybody upset. But when, <laughs> like, you know, this, this past year I was hunting a certain caliber of whitetails in, in, in Pennsylvania and, and. I was in spots where I was, you know, assuming I was going to see this deer and I did see him one time, but in that process, I saw more bucks than I ever did 
they're in that period of small eight points, young two year olds, you know, year and a half year olds, even some three year olds. It was like, and it was just like, yeah, you put yourself in those scenarios. You have, you have opportunities at other just by osmosis of, you know, just being there and, and being around it. But going back to the, um, the turkey hunting thing. So like you're talking about just sitting somewhere, you know, midday and, you know, maybe snapping some sticks and everything. I, I meant to say it back at that point, but I had to bring it up because my, my, so my, my grandpa was always big turkey hunter. He used to make turkey calls and like all this stuff. And, and, and he always was like, I oh, let all the, the young guys go out and, and screw with them early in the morning. And he'd go out and he'd try to find this old Tom and, and he'd be, be quiet and sit there and, and scraping the leaves and, and just be patient. And eventually they come in, you know, quiet to investigate and, you know, he ends up killing them. I mean, Hey, kind of sounds a little bit similar. Dude, I'm telling you, <laughs> basically like calling elk. It's just done. What it's funny is like you, you get what you put into it in a way. Like I have turkeys. Like if I was at a different window, I could see turkeys from my house. And like hunting turkeys, you know, valley birds is what I call them, is is totally different than like you know you go chase Miriams in the mountains, mountain birds. Man, it's just a it's a totally different game. And I'm sure where you are, it's probably similar. Like you go in the mountains and hunt birds, and you're like chasing them across ridges totally yeah. different than like oh yeah in grandma's you know back 40 there's like a tom that comes to the same field every single day of course you can kill him and so like is that like hunting elk no but like going in the mountains and and you know learning country like i don't know i enjoy it uh for me like actually i used to hunt turkeys a lot and i kind of got out of it they started a lot more spring bear and it goes back to that whole thing where everyone wants to go spring bear hunting now so i'm like i'm gonna go turkey hunting now uh and it's like for me my whole goal with turkey hunting was like, I'm just going to go scout for elk. I want to go scout new locations. And if I come across a turkey, great, you know, and literally last year, like I was like, I want to go check out this new glassing point, see what I can see. I hike out to this glassing point. I get to it. I'm looking at elk and all of a sudden a bird gobbles like a hundred yards away. I was like, perfect. And I like went down and killed this bird, you know? And I was like, so for me, it's like a great way to explore <laughs> country. Uh, it's fun calling in birds too. Like I just like calling animals, whatever. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and that's, no, you're, you're, you're spot on. And, and I do that with turkey hunting here for scouting new deer spots. Like I, I go to places that I want to scout and I turkey hunt and in with the main goal of, you know, finding deer sign and, and trying to check it out, but making an excuse to do it. But it's funny you say that I'm actually, I was just talking to a buddy. I was like, I might go out if, cause I'm really banking on getting a Montana tag again this year for, for elk. And I was like, well, I'm going to have the license anyways. Maybe I should go out and, and turkey and bear hunt again. And I was more of a focus on turkeys because like last time I was hunting bear and I, I did end up killing a bear there, but we had found these turkeys and, and, uh, and you know, it's also a place that I, I like to hunt elk sometimes. So it's like, all right, it's, it's pretty cool to go in there and, and hunt turkeys in the mountains and, and do that. I'm like, maybe I'll do that and just like backpack in and, and hunt turkeys. Like that would be, that'd be a lot of fun. I've never <laughs> killed a Miriam before. So, you know, I called that one in for Kurt. Um, but you know, the, the selfish brother that he is, he's killed a bunch of them and I was the one <laughs> calling, but, uh, no, it, it, uh, it was just, it was a super fun, fun experience. And, you know, and again, learned a lot about, you know, elk that end up translating to that September from hunting, you know, turkeys in the area. Yeah. See, we proved it. Elk or, or calling turkeys is the same as calling elk. <laughs> gonna have to cut that cut that up as a clip and make sure that gets <laughs> shared so that everyone hates on cody for uh, it <laughs> yeah i don't care oh yeah <laughs> that's funny yeah man well yeah, yeah hit me up i mean if uh if you get out for turkey hunting we'll have to we'll have to do some hunting together and, and maybe we'll line out a, a whitetail hunt in november or something like that <laughs> yeah man that would be that would be an absolute blast but no i um I, I think we should probably wrap this this one up here, Cody. But um, and yeah, for for anyone that's listening, whether you're listening to mine or or yours, we haven't determined how this is going out yet. But do you want to give some some people some information to check out um, from the the elk hunting perspective and all the stuff that you have going on? Yeah, um, I mean, right now my podcast. If if you're on uh, on Bo's podcast, it's you know the Rich Outdoors, <laughs> but I also do a ton of elk hunting stuff. Uh, so you know the elk hunt podcast. Uh, we, we do a ton of, there's a ton of old content there. Uh, I mean, you can listen for literally weeks. Uh, and you know, we put out, we try to put out an episode every single week this year and we have an elk hunting course. Uh, you know, it's kind of like my four step system to, to, to killing elk. And for me, you know, it's a lot of like, 
I, I try to like build a system around like how I do it. And that's what I show you is like, here's, here's my system. And then here's how to build your own system. So if that, you know, if this podcast, when we were talking about elk resonates with you, uh, check that as well. We also this year are doing a ton of giveaways. Um, and so we're doing gear giveaways every single month. So a bunch of cool stuff going on over on the elk hunt stuff. Um, and then, yeah, Bo, tell him, I mean, if you're a whitetail guy or if you're interested in whitetail, definitely check out Bo. I feel like he's the most relatable whitetail guy I've ever listened to or, or known. So, uh, yeah, check out Bo's podcast, East meets West, uh, and anything else. What else you got going on? We get to get the outdoors cl- or out, outdoor. Yeah class whitetail class course whatever you call it yeah yeah I'll, yeah I'll, yeah the course on outdoor class of it's just full on it's just based around specifically finding whitetails and just kind of my system for how i break things down in a more organized way than i can explain on a podcast of like kind of my system for you know identifying areas and and trying to go in and and just find deer and then going in and and translating to scouting and doing that and i also have a bunch of um content on my youtube channel which is just under my name uh bo martonic so you can go in and a bunch of scouting videos a bunch of whitetail stuff and then some hunting films you can watch the elk stuff that we talked about here and and see me try to be an elk hunter and uh do that kind of <laughs> stuff too so yeah man well good stuff um well yeah thanks for thanks for jumping on and uh yeah i mean let's keep in touch let's uh let's make something happen let's go on a hunt together i like it man let's do it thanks so much for listening to this episode of east meets west hunt with your host bo martonic for more great content and to stay up to date visit east meets west hunt.com facebook at east meets west outdoors and instagram at east meets west hunt if you enjoyed today's episode please review and subscribe and we'll catch you next time